Yeah, cool guys. Well, thanks for coming out and everything like that. So, this is uh, this has been a cool thing for me because you know I've shopped here at the store so many times in the past, and I've wanted to actually teach a class here. Um, you know, it, it's just definitely a, a cool thing to bring it all around. So. Um, so my name is Matt Van Ness. I am the owner of MV Film Productions. Um, I am based in Meriden, Connecticut, with an office in Southington, Connecticut, which is right next door. Um, and the cool thing about um, what I do is um, we are wedding filmmakers, and we basically take uh, couples the, the best day of their lives, and we basically make a story out of it. So uh, for those watching, you guys probably understand what I'm talking about. And um, today I'm kind of here to talk about a little bit of an overview of the class and uh, of this class and kind of the do's and don'ts that I found out over the years of doing this. Um, what I found is great, what I found is maybe not so great, um, and a little bit of uh, behind the scenes of what I do and everything like that. So. Um, Jump right in. Again, my name is Matthew Brian Van Ness. Uh, just a couple of photos to show uh, from photographers I've worked in the past, some really cool behind the scenes stuff. Um, uh, the, the, the wedding industry, I think, is changing this day and age um, just because uh, the technology is changing. And the people that are getting married, I find that are, you know, some of them are getting younger. And, and some of them are, are bringing new features into the industry that um, you know, people want to, to experience. You know, drones, new technology, um, just overall lighting concepts. And those are technical things that we'll talk about today a little bit. Um, but again, these are just some pictures I want to show who I am. And uh, I want to actually show a film right off the bat. This is actually a film um, I shot down in Philadelphia um, about three weeks ago. And I'm a little biased because it's actually my cousin's wedding. <laughs> um, but yes, I'm going to show this film. It's a short trailer, or a mini film, as I like to call it. Kind of gives you uh, the folks that are watching a little bit of an idea of uh, what I do uh, for a living and some of my style. Um, and then we'll, we'll go into the course overview. So should play. There it goes. <laughs> Thank you, dear Lord, for your loving presence. Thank you, dear Lord, for the gift of family and the gift of friends. And thank you, dear Lord, for that blessed gift of marriage, that loving union that unites us all. Amen. to have witnessed innumerable moments with the two of them where they've challenged each other, supported each other, laughed with each other, and even cried with each other. They are truly best friends who can talk to each other about everything, good, bad, everything in between. I said their love is a love so deeply rooted in friendship, it's only fitting that they officially join themselves together as a family.
I said their love is a love so deeply rooted in friendship, it's only fitting that they officially join themselves together as family. Laura and Matt, you guys are two of the kindest, most humble, most intelligent. Honestly, watch out, their kids are going to be baby Einsteins. <laughs> and most caring individuals, and I'm so thankful, I mean this wholeheartedly, that you guys have found each other. is the kind that awakens the soul and makes us reach for more, that plants a fire in our hearts and brings peace to our minds. And I generally think that's the love that you guys have for each other, bringing peace to each other's souls. And I'm honored to stand here beside you today and for all the years to come as you guys continue to grow in love and friendship together. So I'd like to end with an Irish blessing. May love and laughter light your days and warm your heart and home. May good and faithful friends be yours wherever you may roam. May peace and plenty bless your world with joy that long endures. May all life's passing seasons bring the best to you and yours. I love you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, for those just joining and everything like that, um, basically that was just a short mini film um, that my business produces. Um, again, my name is Matt Van Ness. I'm the owner of MV Film Productions, um, based in Connecticut, Central Connecticut. And um, it, you know, it, I think it's a really cool thing that I'm able to be down here in New York City at B&H to, uh, to show a class. Um, today is an overview of my opinion on the wedding industry and what we're going to talk about today, actually. This is what we're going to talk about. It's kind of a course overview. Um, we're going to go through a lot of information today. Um, you know, for, for those, it's kind of a class that for those that are starting out, guys have been in for a while, and a little bit of an overview um, of what's going on, in my opinion, with today's uh, industry. So we're going to talk about um, wedding cinema industry opinion. Why do we do what we do? Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the do's and don'ts. And when I say the do's and don'ts, these are strictly my opinions and what I've experienced over my time in the wedding industry in terms of cinema and creating films. Um, it's not necessarily a ne uh, negative thing, it's just things that I've noticed that, hey, this could be done uh, a little bit better, and this could be done, uh, you know, maybe not so much, so better. So uh, we talked about, about some tips and tricks, and some, contact, uh, some tactical techniques and concepts that I've kind of developed and created over my years of doing this. And then we'll have an open discussion, uh, questions for anybody here today. Um, I want to do mention um, the last film that I showed, I said before, I was a little biased. That was my cousin Lauren that got married in downtown Philadelphia. Um, but that was a recent film. That was only a month ago, I want to say. So um, trying to show the most recent work that we've produced. Um, I do have a couple other films I'm going to show as well. Um, and the photography aspects that you guys will see in my presentation, those are a credit to uh, my good friend Aaron Miller. Aaron Miller is a, a wedding photographer based in Connecticut as well. We do a lot of weddings together. Um, so I, I definitely want to do a shout out to him if he's watching. So I appreciate you uh, Let me use your photographs and everything. And the photographs that you will see, they're obviously weddings that we've shot the video for. <laughs> so all right, so we're going to move on. Actually, here's film number two. It's not as long. This is a wedding I just shot this past Saturday. So gives you another idea for those that are just tuning in how we do. I am John's first cousin. We basically grew up together. And just like Tasso said, he's more than just a cousin. He's my brother, like one of my little brothers. 
as, as we all get older, as time goes on, it's harder to get to see each other. It's harder to get together. And especially when um, my grandparents passed, it was a lot of things changed because they were the glue that kept everybody together. You had the hierarchies. And so every Sunday we were, every Sunday we spent together and, and that changed when they went. So when they asked me to be the Kubata, I was kind of like, oh God, it's, you know, I was honored because I know that together we'll be able to keep the traditions going, keep the family together. And to me, that was the most special thing. And then meeting Rhoda, it's just so beautiful because her family is just like our family. It's all about tradition. It's all about love. It's, it's all about family. And it makes me so happy to know that my cousin, my little brother, is going to be with someone that's going to carry that tradition and that we'll be able to live on the legacy of our grandparents. That That's what they taught us is what Tasso said as well, too. I kind of, I didn't write anything down and he kind of made me nervous because your speech was pretty awesome. But um, I just wanted to speak from the heart. And honestly, it's just an honor for me to be here and to be in the presence of both of you with so much love. I wish you guys all the happiness in the world. I know you guys are gonna have an amazing life because you're both amazing. You're both very special. I love you both, thank you.
All right, so thank you. So the reason I showed those two films right off the bat is just because um, the first one and the second one were two different types of weddings. Um, you had the first one where you're in the downtown city life and you had that busy feeling where everything was happening at once with a first look and you had uh, your ceremony at, at your reception venue and it was more of a all one location type of deal. And then you had the second one which literally was this past Saturday that we shot and you had that more laid back feel. You had that country feel outside in the woods, um, getting ready at the house uh, for bridal preparations. You had um, a church ceremony which in their case they were both Greek so they had a lot of Greek traditions brought into the mix and obviously from there we go to a reception venue and we have the reception there as well. So I kind of wanted to just show those two because A, they were right off the bat, re most recent works, pieces of work that we've done, and B, they're two different aspects of what we do. Um, and FYI, for those who are just tuning in that might have seen parts of those films, um, these are mini films. So these are not the full feature piece that we are giving to our couples and everything like that. They are done within actually 24 hours after our, our wedding has conducted. So it's one of the things we'll talk about a little bit about behind the scenes of what I do. But um, I just wanted to make sure that everybody got a chance to see a little bit of uh, our style of work. So we'll get right into the course today. So the do's and don'ts. The do's and don'ts, it's not necessarily a negative thing. People were asking me when I was creating the class, you know, what do you mean by the don'ts? You know, the do's are always a good thing. The don'ts, what does that mean? And obviously in the do's, there's a lot more information that I'm going to talk about today. But the don'ts are things that I've kind of figured out over the years of doing this to say, hey, you know what, maybe we shouldn't do that. Or we shouldn't try this. Or maybe this shot doesn't work. Or you know, we'll get into those details and everything like that. Um, I, one thing I didn't mention is that I've been doing this now for almost 14 years. I've um, been doing my actual business for 12 and video in general for 14. So um, you know, I, I've experienced a lot. I've seen a lot go on in the industry. And there's a lot of things that go on to a wedding. It's not just set up a camera, start filming. There's a lot of different moving parts that we kind of need to make sure we know all aspects to be able to create the story that we want to tell for a couple. Um, and also that we are storytellers. You know, there, there's multiple different types of video in the world for the wedding industry. But for myself, I've really come to the, to the terms that I love the artistic value of cinema. So for us, when we are, are creating a film, we're not just going out randomly and shooting and coming back to piece it together and figure out how we're going to do this. We have a, a goal in mind, and we have an idea already in our head how we want to create this film. And then the day of the wedding comes out, and we go out and we execute those shots that we need to be able to create. So um, let's talk about the do's and don'ts. Basically, it's an overview. There's a lot of information that's going to show up on the screen in a second. <laughs> Don't freak out. I will explain what's going on. All right, so the do's. There's obviously a lot more do's than don'ts that I've obviously come up with. And that's obviously a positive thing. Um, these are in no specific order, but I definitely want to touch base a little bit upon um, some of these. And, and for those that are taking notes, you know, that's, that's awesome. Um, my goal today is to hopefully inspire those who are watching, those that are here, to maybe uh, take some information back to their businesses and what they do, and uh, be able to, c to just take their films from this level to the next level. Um, Obviously, everything I'm about to say, nothing is copyrighted, so it's all free information. It's just stuff that I've created over the or thought about over the years during my uh, creative mind. Um, so let's go right into it. So knowing your place in the wedding atmosphere. All right. So for those who are wedding filmmakers, wedding cinematographers, wedding videographers, people that are shooting video in the wedding industry, um, knowing your place in the wedding atmosphere is key. And when I say knowing your place, I mean that in a positive way. I mean that by where do I need to be at all times? What does my timeline say? Where are my locations? Where is my second filmmaker going to be going to? And what's his location going to be at? As well as at the actual wedding itself. You know, during bridal preparations, for those that shoot you know, hair and makeup and the guys getting ready and things like that, you know, where do you need to be at all times? Where do you need to know, OK, this shot has got good lighting. This shot over here has a, a great reaction in the moment. Um, am I intruding on people? Am I being in the way of mom and dad who maybe are watching or what's going on? You know, I think these are key things that, that people don't necessarily Necessarily pay attention to, and that's not necessarily a bad thing because their mind is right into the the day's events. But they almost have to take a step back and say, "Okay, you know what? I realize I'm kind of being right on top of the bride and groom, and I, I kind of got to give them their space." Um, if you guys noticed before with the films that you saw before during the bridal preparation part of it, a lot of those shots seem like they're very close up, really in in their personal space, and we do that on purpose, but we don't actually stand on top of them. You know, we are using the right lenses to be able to capture that real moment where we can be across the room in the house and not have to be on top of that person to show that emotion, but at the same time not making that person feel uncomfortable where they're like, OK, I'm standing here, and there's a camera lens right here. I want to make sure that people are feeling as 
best, as, as comfortable as they can possibly be on their wedding day and not realize that we're actually there. So again, knowing your place in the wedding atmosphere, and that just goes for, for the whole day. You know, that's not necessarily just for bridal preparations. That's for the church. That's for the reception. That's for the creative session in between. And there's a little bit more. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but I just want to start off with you know, knowing your place in the wedding atmosphere. Um, moving on, introducing yourself to those who may not know who you are. Quote, uh, parentheses, parents, bridal party members, other vendors, the day of, et cetera. All right, so I know from experience, and this is not a bad thing, but one of my uh, biggest things that I like to do when I arrive to the location of a wedding is introduce myself. Introduce myself to those who I may not know. Obviously, I know my bride and groom, and I may know the parents. I may know um, a person in the bridal party. Maybe it's a, a referral, and I did the cousin's wedding or the sister's wedding from years past or whatever, and that's great. But for me to walk in, for example, at bridal prep, and there's eight, nine girls around with hair and makeup artists all around that don't necessarily know who I am, I want to make sure that they're comfortable knowing that, hey, okay, there's a guy in the room, he's going to be filming us, it's a cool laid back atmosphere. I kind of always say, hey girls, you know, my name is Matt, just do your thing. You know, kind of ignore me even though you know I'm here, I'm kind of like a fly on the wall. And that's kind of my overall goal is by introducing myself to those people who don't know me because the more I become comfortable with them, the better off the film will be towards the end. Especially with little kids. You know, you have, little, you have a, a flower girl, a ring bearer, little kids running around. You don't want them kind of shying away from you and not being able to get a shot of them throughout the day. I kind of want to make them you know, as comfortable as possible. So if I can get down to their level and introduce myself and kind of joke around with them a little bit, they may be a little bit more comfortable with me throughout the day and I'm able to capture those moments when they're having fun, running around, when the little flower girl is doing a funny dance on the dance floor. I have the opportunity to capture those moments versus a little five-year-old seeing me and deer in the headlights going, who's this guy with a camera? I got to run to my mom. So, and that's just going for the kid aspect. You know, obviously in the adult world, you know, introducing myself to the parents of the bride, parents of the groom, grandparents. You know, we're here and we're being paid to capture our couple's day. So I want to make sure everybody knows who I am and knows what we're going to be doing and everything will go smooth from that part, hopefully. <laughs> um, so again, that doesn't also pertain to just bridal party members and parents. It also pertains to vendors. So are you working with a wedding coordinator? Are you working with a wedding photographer? Are you working with a live band? Um, that Greek wedding I just showed you before, they had a live band. And I know I had to reach out to um, the DJ and the um, uh, person that was basically doing the introductions. And I had to reach out to them and say, hey, you know, I'm Matt. Introduce myself. I actually introduced the photographer and just make sure that, you know, we're as the photo video team are on the same page as the DJ who's running the, court, uh, the, the night's events, obviously, so we're not missing a moment. And obviously, in a, a wedding, it's a live event. So the pressure is on us to make sure we're capturing those moments and not missing anything crucial because we can't just go back and say, can you redo that? Excuse me, sir, rewind, let's redo that. We don't have that opportunity. So, you know, kind of, again, introducing yourself and knowing who's who, that way you are able to basically not miss anything and people are aware of, okay, there's a cinematographer here, there's a videographer here, somebody's going to be capturing the day, um, you know, in motion picture. Um, for example, I know this past week I introduced, I introduced myself uh, to the two priests at the church. And, um, you know, one of the main things in audio um, in a wedding film is that uh, in a church, it's always hard to capture the audio. We have to kind of be creative in how we're going to capture that. Whether we're going to put a lapel mic on our groom, which is something that we do, we're going to put recorders around the room, we're going to put, uh, we're going to tap into the church system to get an audio feed. That's great. And the reason I bring this up is because this past weekend, I introduced myself to the two priests, and the priest right away saw that I had a wireless microphone in my hand. He goes, would you like me to take that? And I said, oh, this is actually for the groom. He goes, well, the groom, bride and groom aren't going to be doing much speaking because it's a, it's a Greek tradition, uh, it's a Greek ceremony. Uh, would you like me to put it on myself and the other priests? I said, absolutely. If you guys are going to be doing all the speaking, I would love to have the source come right, or the audio come right from the source. So the priest said, absolutely, no problem. And I do remember right at the end as I was walking out to start the ceremony, he goes, thank you for introducing yourself. I appreciate that. And I said, Father, absolutely, my pleasure. So that's just a quick example of how introducing yourself can kind of take you from here to here. You know, if I didn't introduce myself and I just walked in and started filming, the priest didn't know maybe there was video. He might not have known that I needed audio, obviously. And he probably wouldn't have mentioned to me, you know, hey, I'll put the mic on myself and I'll put the mic on the other priest as well. So that was a big bonus for me. And I know in that film, when I brought it back to the studio and we started working on the ceremony um, beginning of the week, the audio was crystal clear. So I'm super excited for that couple. I can't wait to share that film with them. Um, but again, you know, introducing yourself, that's, that's to me a huge key point. Um, and some of these things, you know, people may know already. 
and that's great, but I'm just kind of bringing it all in you know, full circle and bring it back to uh, the basics a little bit. Um, knowing your, uh, your own cinema timeline. All right, so timelines. A lot of people get stressed out about timelines. Time is something we cannot change. We cannot go back in time. We cannot move time forward, obviously. But a timeline for me in my business is crucial when I'm in the pre-production phase of working with a bride and groom. And a lot of times what I like to do is after I actually secure that wedding with that couple, meaning that they are booking with us, they've paid a deposit, they sign a contract, I love to sit down with them in my office and really talk about their day and what they're going to be planning for if they haven't had it already planned out. Um, working with that couple to say, OK, where are bridal preparation starting for those that shoot bridal prep? Um, where's your ceremony? Are you doing a first look? Is there a creative session in between? And for those of you who don't know a creative session, I'm talking about you know working with a photographer for bridal party shots, family shots, bride and groom shots. That's really the, the heart and soul of the film that comes to life there. Um, knowing that location and knowing where we're going to be and what time and how we're getting there and all these logistics uh, all come into the timeline. And then, of course, obviously working in the reception portion of the night. You know, Where are we going to be? What's the location? What time do we start cocktail hour? What time do we end? Things like that. So the timeline for me is something that I like to uh, go by. I know with my team that shoots weddings with me, for the second shooters, they get a copy of the timeline for every wedding. And I'm somebody that even goes uh, the extra mile. And I like to call my guys the night before. You know, I send them the timeline in the middle of the week. I say, hey, guys, check out the timeline when you can. You'll know where you're going. And they've been with me for years. But I still like to give them that follow-up phone call the night before the wedding. And I like to say, OK, you know, Max, Nick, Mike, are you guys ready to go for tomorrow? Do we have any questions? Let's go through a basic rundown of our timeline, make sure we're 110% on the same locations that we need to be at. Oh, I'm sorry, the different locations that we need to be at. Uh, do we know the exact time for the guys starting to get ready? Do we know the exact time for the girls to start getting ready? Things like that. And these things might be you know, repetitive, or people might know these things already. but. You'd be surprised how many guys I know that actually do video that kind of just fly by the seat of their pants. And that's great if they do that. But I feel that if you don't have a solid timeline down, you're going to run into issues that probably could have been avoided if you just took the time to do a little pre-production meeting, sit down with that couple, and really just hash out, OK, we're starting at uh, 8.30 in the morning for hair and makeup, and we're leaving at 1. OK, great. Video, I'll show up at like maybe 10.30, 11, 12-ish, do some details, get some hair and makeup. Boom, move on with the day there. Um, you know, Like I said, anybody that is doing their own business, obviously, much respect for what you guys do. And this is all just information that I've come to find that is successful for myself. So I'll take it for, for what you guys want to learn. But again, a timeline for me is super crucial with that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, too, as we go on. Uh, here's a big key point. Being a fly on the wall status. And I put fly on the wall in quotes. And because I put that in quotes, it's, it's something that's super, super important to me. I've been told from whether it's a review, people calling me, people telling me in person, they know my work and they love my work because we are not obtrusive, we are not in their face, and we are really not seen throughout the day. Obviously, if you have a ceremony, for example, where it's on location of the venue and you're obviously going to, you know, moving around a little bit from a lawn ceremony, you have chairs set up and you have a main center aisle, people are going to know you're there, give or take, obviously. But you can still be a fly on the wall, you know, picking your area where you need to be able to get those two camera angle shots or three camera angle shots, you know, making sure that you're not moving around like a jackrabbit and you're just kind of discreetly moving when you need to move. Um, in a church setting, for example, it's nice when you have big pillars, big columns that you can hide behind. If there's a balcony, you can head up to the balcony for a wide shot. Um, yeah, things like, you know, I think we're going to talk about this in a little bit later, but respecting the priest's wishes where you don't go on the altar, you know, you don't stay in the center aisle. You know, big thing for me is not. Uh, blocking, um, or what, big thing for me is making sure I don't block parents, grandparents, guests, things like that. And again, the reason I bring all this up is because I know people, or I've seen videos, or I've seen photographers who have taken behind the scenes pictures of uh, videographers or filmmakers that are kind of in the wrong. And I put in the wrong quotes again because you know their mindset might be, hey, I got to get the shot. That's great. We all got a job. We're all here for one reason. That's for a couple to capture a day. But how do we capture that shot? You know, can I be, do I necessarily need to be at the front row? I'm using the chairs for example. Do I need to be in the front row with a 24 millimeter wide lens to capture the kiss? Or can I work with a photographer and be in the back row with a 70 to 200? And with that, we both are able to capture a shot together, side by side, and we're not blocking guests because those guests are from our point up. So it's things like that that I kind of think about, oh, I'm a fly on the wall. 
you know, I, I almost don't want to be seen during a wedding. You know, when I walk in the bridal prep, I'm somebody that's very outgoing. I sometimes get a little too loud. Uh, I like to have fun, and I like to talk to people. But at the same time, I got to know my place. So when is it appropriate to talk to those people? And when is it appropriate to kind of be like, OK, I'm just going to stand over here, do my thing, and hey, there's a real moment. Let me zoom in and get that moment, and boom, I got it captured, and not have to stage anything. All right. So again, flying the wall stats, it could be for bridal prep. It could be for your ceremony. It could even be for your reception. Um, you know, my biggest thing is when it comes to speeches, you know, making sure that I give the dance floor kind of some space. That way, you know, when we're filming the speeches, which you might have seen in the films before, you know, we have a 7200 millimeter lens on. So we're able to stay in the back, zoom in, get that tight shot of the person giving the speech and the reaction of the bride and groom, but we're not blocking from the first and second and third tables the family members, the bridal party members, the guests that are there, et cetera. Because what happens, I found, this day and age is everybody has a, phone, a camera in their pocket nowadays. Everybody has a phone, whether it's an iPhone or another uh, device. And you know, people can be taking back behind the scenes photos of you doing something, and you don't want that to come back and bite you in the butt because you, know, you were goofing off or you were doing whatever. You are in the, public view, uh, the public's eye when it comes to a wedding. And one thing we're going to talk about later on is how do you get recommended, how do you get more business, and how do you get referrals? Well, if you're the guy that's staying in the center aisle of a church and you're blocking grandma, grandpa, guests and things like that, the guest that's standing in the, in the, uh, the last pew row or the last pew closest to the row, uh, center aisle, says, hey, I'm getting married, but I don't really like that guy. He's standing right there. I can't see anything. Boom, you might have just lost business. So for me, you know, again, being a fly on the, on the wall status is crucial. That kind of goes hand in hand, I guess, a little bit with knowing you know, your, at, your place in the wedding and your at, the atmosphere that you're in. Um, but my biggest thing is just knowing, you know, hey, don't be obtrusive, don't be obnoxious, things like that. So again, fly on the wall is kind of the, the term I use. Um, everybody has their own, uh, own status. Um, one thing that I do like to mention before now is uh, being one or two steps ahead of the game. And I, I put a dash mark, I say, anticipating what may happen next. So what do I mean by this? I mean that when you are actually on location for a wedding, you know, your, your head should be in it 110%. Your head should be in it for the bride and groom, for the bridal party, for the family members, and your team as well as the photography team and the vendors. Um, one or two steps ahead. It's a live event. Guys, anything can happen. You know, things can go south real quick. Hopefully they won't. But you never know. We can't control the weather. I've done my fair share of weddings in blizzards, pouring rain, hurricanes, you name it. I've pretty much been there. So for me to anticipate one or two steps ahead, that kind of gives me a safety zone and a buffer zone. So when I say one or two steps ahead of the game, OK, all right, what time is it? It is currently such and such time. OK, we're going to leave at 2. It's 12 o'clock. Well, let's see. I need to make sure that I'm at the church at least by 1.30 because I know I have to get audio set up for the groom, for the piano, for the priest. OK, that's going to take me about 15 minutes. OK, so great. I get there. Maybe I leave at 1.15 to get there for 1.30, depending on how far of a drive I have to go. So what time does that mean? I have to, what time do I have to leave from bridal prep? So when I say one or two steps ahead, maybe when I'm doing hair and makeup shots, I'm in my head thinking about my next move, saying, all right, you know what? We're getting close. Probably should have my gear packed up, have things staged by the front door so I can get out the door real quick when family starts to come in and say hi. You know, don't park, think, small things. Don't park in the driveway because the party bus could park right in front of the driveway and block you in. Now you can't get out in time to get to the church to get set up for the audio and get set up for the, for the wedding. So one or two steps ahead of the game and again, anticipating what may happen next. Guys, obviously you can't anticipate everything that's going to happen, but if you kind of have a clear mental picture in your head of what is going to flow and almost memorizing that timeline and memorizing those, loca lo those locations, uh, it's going to help you guys in, in the field, obviously, and a little bit less stress. Um, I always joke around, I have a lot of gray hair on the side, and I'm a younger person. I think the gray hair comes from just stress overall. Um, and, you know, in the wedding industry, it is a stressful event, you know, because we're passionate about what we do. We want to be able to capture those once in a lifetime moments for that couple. But at the same time, how do we do that? It might require us to run around a little bit and to uh, you know, dig in a little bit and get those shots that we need to in a stressful manner. Um, so again, you know, just thinking ahead. You know, don't just think about the moment. Don't get tunnel vision. Don't think about where you are, what's going on right there. Also think about what's coming next to anticipate it. You know, being able to have a phone in your pocket and texting your second shooter and saying, hey, man, I'm leaving in about 10 minutes. Why don't you head out 10 minutes before I do so that way you get to the church and start detail shots. These are great examples that I do in my industry all year long, and hopefully these are ideas that you know, may, you know, the light bulb might go off in your head if you guys aren't doing it already, and that can help you guys further in the future. 
um, choosing the right lens, um, obviously for the specific part of the day. You know, obviously the cameras, you know, cameras that actually interchange. So, you know, DSLRs, cinema bodies from the C100 range. Obviously, those are lenses that can change. That's what I'm talking about. You know, if you guys are using the cameras that are, you know, 20x optical zoom and things like that, obviously this is not something for you guys right this second. But when it comes to choosing the right lens, you know, for your ceremony, for your reception, for your bridal preparations, for your creative shots, you know. Which lens am I going to use? Do I use a 24 to 105, 24 to 70, a 70 to 200, a macro? You know, where do you as a cinematographer figure out and when and why I'm going to pick this lens? You know, my go-to lenses are a 24 to 105, a 70 to 200, and probably a 14 or a 24 because it's a crop sensor in my cameras. Um, why, why do I use those lenses as my go-to's? Because over the years of doing this, I know what specific shots I want to capture with those. 7200, most likely, obviously, for your church ceremonies. Because again, as I talked before, I don't want to be all up in the bride and groom's sp a personal space, especially if there's a priest involved with the altar. So how do I, quote unquote, snipe in and get that tight shot of the rings being placed on from that uh, over the shoulder shot and not have to be in the way of anybody? Great, 7200. Am I going to use a 24 for that? Probably not. Probably not a prime lens either, obviously. Um, but at the same time, let's say I'm doing a really creative shot at the end of the night for a ring shot, you know, or I'm doing a detailed shot of uh, the shoes or, or her dress. Maybe I want to use a macro lens. In our arsenal of lenses, we have a 100 millimeter macro. So the macro is obviously a great lens to isolate just the specific detail you want and make the background soft and blurry, which is a great effect in my, in my opinion for the wedding industry. So choosing the right lens, again, I'm not going to go too, mu too much into detail of that because everybody has different lenses. And obviously, you know why you pick those lenses. For me, it's just making sure that I know, again, going into the preparations or going into the ceremony, OK, great, this is the lenses I'm bringing in. This is what I need. This is going to get the job done. All right. Um, church wedding ceremony etiquette. All right, so this is something that is not necessarily just in the cinema world. I see this in terms of photographers, you know, wedding planners, um, guests. <laughs> um, it, it's not a bad thing. When I say etiquette, I don't mean the, the negative side of it. I mean, you know, knowing where to be when necessary, obeying any priest rules or requests, and being kind and courteous to guests. These are things that obviously I do 110% all the time. Um, you know, you can you can't control your guests. You can't control the people that are there. But you hope that they're going to not get in your way. And I say that respectfully. Um, hopefully, you know, you don't get the, you, you try to go for an unplugged wedding where you don't have people doing this in the center aisle. Um, in in the one of the last films you saw, everybody had their phone out like this trying to get the shot of the bride and her father coming down. And you know, you can't, you can't tell every single person in the, in the uh, church to put their phones away. But you obviously got to work with what you have. But Knowing where to be and uh, when it's necessary, you know, what side of the, for the cinematographers in the video world, you know, what side of the church do you need to be on? You know, I, with my business, shoot two cameras, sometimes three. So, you know, I have left side covered, right side covered, back side covered. Um, sometimes I don't have the back side covered and I just have one and two. So how do I know as the uh, first shooter and the owner of my business, where do I need to be? Where does my second filmmaker need to be? What angle is he getting? What angle am I getting? Because the worst thing you can do, in my opinion, has two cameras doing the same exact angle. Because otherwise, what am I going to cut to when it comes time for post-production? So anticipating the wedding, you know, knowing a church ceremony, knowing a Catholic mass. I've met guys that shoot weddings and they've been doing it for a long time, but they don't know anything about the Catholic church and they don't know anything about mass and how a service happens and what comes next. You know, you have the first and second readings, great. They don't realize that normally after that you have the priest homily and the gospel. Okay, well if they don't know that and they start to move, they've just basically left the spot that they should have been in to capture the priest who's going to give a homily, which was specifically written for that bride and groom. So again, knowing what comes next to say, you know what, I can't move. First and second reading just happened, let me stay here, because I know the priest is going to come up to the pulpit and, and give the homily. Then from there I know, okay, he's probably going to go into the session where they do the vows, the rings, things like that. So again, knowing where to be in a church setting, uh, or in a ceremony setting in a church. Obviously when it comes to those ceremonies that are outdoors and you have a, I don't want to call them a lawn wedding, but you have a wedding where the ceremony is on site of the reception. You know, okay, well, you have makeshift aisle with white chairs on both sides. Okay, great. We can kind of treat it like a church ceremony, but you're going to have a justice of the peace. You may or may not have a reading or two. Um, you're definitely going to have vows and rings, whether the bride and groom write their own vows or they recite from the JP. But either way, you still need to get a two camera angle shot, at least in my opinion. You know, you can do one camera angle from the back, but 
to make it very cinematic and artistically storytelling wise, you want to have a couple different angles to cut to. Um, so again, you know, okay, if I'm going to be here getting the the JP giving uh, the 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 reading out or anything like that, I want to make sure that my second shooter is either A, on the bride and groom, or B, looking back at my guests that are in attendance and getting the reaction. Um, you know, looking for things like mom and dad that may be sitting next to each other holding hands, watching their son or daughter, you know, say their vows. Um, looking for the little flower girl who may be in the front row smiling or tearing up or, or for whatever the case may be, their emotions. You know, emotions are huge. Um, you know, obviously in a church, you know, when a priest says, please respect the altar, do not walk on the altar, do not, you know, move around too much, to me that's a given. You know, I know and I go into any church wedding knowing that I shouldn't walk on the altar, I shouldn't run around, I shouldn't be screaming loud or yelling across the church to, to my other guy or anything like that. These are things that people would think are common, but I've also encountered people, photographers, you know, other vendors and things like that, that don't necessarily do that. And in the video world, I'm trying to bring the point across that what will make you guys get more business and really have a name stand out for yourself is that recommendation and that networking and that word of mouth. So if somebody says, you know, hey, the photographer, yeah, he was all right. He was running around a little bit. But uh, the videographers, they were really just in one spot. But when I saw the film, it's like they had six different angles. That's like, to me, one of the highest compliments I can get from guests, family members. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Do you, um, so when you're like trying to get different angles. Yes. Um, do you like talk to your other shooter? Like you guys have like mics and like walkie talkies where you communicate where, you know, let's say for example you have a shot but then I guess someone gets in your way right. so you ask like, you know, the other shooter to do it. Yes. Or do you guys just kind of do it in a way where um, you like switch off at regular intervals? Like, yes. Do you have a specific angle you take it if your shooter has a specific angle they take it? Absolutely, that's a great question. That's a great question. Um, with the team of, of guys that I have for my business, uh, a lot of what we do is we talk after a wedding or before a wedding. And that's going back to that whole phone call thing at the night before. Going back to post-production, or I'm sorry, pre-production, and knowing about my wedding and the day that's coming up and where the church is going to be, I kind of like to have all that information ahead of time. So then I can go to my guys and say, OK, guys, today, the Greek wedding. Greek, Greek, tradition, bleh, excuse me, Greek traditions will be conducted at the ceremony site. And my guys say, OK, great. Are they going to do the crossing of the crowns? Are they going to walk around the altar, which in that film you saw they did. You know, Obviously, if we're at a side angle and you have all the guests stand up, now our shot is blocked because they all rose. So again, being one or two steps ahead of the game, anticipating, saying, oh, you know what? After the crowning, he's going to do a little bit more speaking, the priest, and then they're going to walk around the altar. Great. From here, I need to move to the center aisle to get that center shot. So that, for me, is something I need to make sure that my other shooter knows, hey, hold that shot, lock it down, don't move, because Matt's going to move. Now, I know you mentioned, do we have any communication? Do we have walkie-talkies? Do we have radios? I personally don't have any type of like radio or phone set or anything like that that I say, hey, you know, Max, go to the corner and, and take that shot. Um, we do use our phones. And it's kind of weird and wrong. We do text during the ceremony. Um, when I text, I try to be as discreet as possible, and I try to make simple messages, move to the right. Stay there, lock down, I'm moving to the back. Not these long conversations where they have to sit there and read their, their phone, because obviously you don't want the guest to look up and say, why is he on his phone? He should be filming the wedding. What's going on? But these little things where, you know, Max, move to the side. Great. And all of a sudden he moves. And I'm holding that shot down while he moves. So it's, a, it's almost an artistic dance that we do during the ceremony, because we want to make sure that we're both not moving at the same time. You know, it's obviously smart if you have a balcony or, or a back aisle, we can have a, a locked camera on a tripod, you know, where maybe it's, it's either manned or unmanned, but that's your safety shot. So that safety shot is if, we, for whatever reason, both of us are moving, we have something to fall back upon when we're cutting. But I sometimes don't necessarily have that option, especially in an outdoor wedding where it's a 20-minute ceremony, and we don't have all the team members to be able to bring in another camera right in the center aisle to set it up because somebody could bump into it, somebody could knock it, it could go out of focus. So going back to your question, it's a lot about the pre-production and my team knowing how I like to film my weddings and how I'm going to edit my weddings and knowing how we're going to shoot the day of with the details that I get from the bride and groom. So a Greek ceremony is obviously a little bit different than a Catholic ceremony. Or I shouldn't say a Catholic ceremony, a, a regular church going ceremony where they just do the vows and the, the homily and things like that. They don't have any Greek traditions brought into it. You know, okay, well we don't have to worry about them walking around the altar. So we can stay two cut angles side by side or coming from the sides by, by the altar. Um, 
there are some companies out there that I've seen. I've seen photographers that do this. They have little like earpieces. They'll have walkie-talkies and little radios, and they'll communicate through that. That's great. But for me, I don't like to have like stuff on me when I'm shooting a wedding. I like to be clean as possible. The only thing I like to have in my are my earbuds to make sure my audio is monitored. Um, so again, a lot of it is knowing my team, knowing me, and how I like to shoot my weddings in my style. But at the same time, knowing a lot of the details that go into it. So. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, but obviously, anything is possible. You know, if if somebody if you were somebody that says, "Hey, my team, let's get radios and let's be able to communicate that through that way," that's awesome. You know, for me, if I have an earpiece in my ear, I'm listening to the walkie-talkie because my other two guys are trying to tell me where they're going, and I'm trying to listen to my audio for the vows. It doesn't work for me that way. So I rather just real quick, you know, behind the altar or behind the the pillar. Hey, man, uh, go to the back. Done. And boom, he moves, and I'm staying locked down. And that's how I like to communicate a little bit. So. Hopefully that answers your question. Cool. Um, but yes, yeah, so again, kind of wrapping up the part where I talk about you know the, the rules of the priest and the church and things like that, knowing where to be when necessary, and also being courteous to guests. Um, a lot of times, the guests that I've noticed in the weddings recently, you know, they're they're hop, they're hyped up, they're excited. You know, it's their family getting married. I, I totally get it. They almost get that tunnel vision because they just see their bride, who's their cousin or, or, or whoever, and they go right into hugging them, and they don't even realize that we're filming a shot with them. And that gets a little bit of fr a little frustrating on our end, obviously. But we also we understand it. We get it, and we got to make sure we, you know, don't show our frustration right then and there to that to that person that's you know trying to beeline it right to the bride and groom. Um, so being courteous to those guests, you know, saying excuse me, saying please, thank you. These are things that obviously I hope people are doing in this world. But again, I've met some other vendors, even just, they're not photographers, they're not DJs, they're other people. And I've also seen at weddings I've been to where they have a videographer and they're just, you know, pushing people out of the way. They're not really respecting what's going on. And to me, that, that's not right. So I would say the only negative thing I bring around is just, you know, don't be rude. You know, don't, don't be in the way of somebody where they're trying to say hi to somebody. Be courteous to those people, all right? Um, capturing real moments on film. So I don't like to stage anything, to be honest with you, too, too much. You know, when I'm filming a wedding, I like to make sure that myself and my guys that are working with me that day um, are capturing those real moments. And again, I put real in quotes because I do not like to stage too, too much. When I say staging, there might be a shot, for example, when you know, the bride and groom are walking to us and we want to get a gimbal shot of them walking where we're walking backwards, they're walking to us. And I might say, guys, on three, you know, or on one, go for a kiss. So I'm filming them at three, two, one, and they go for a kiss. That's a stage shot. And that obviously is planned out. And I usually let my bride and grooms know that, hey, there might be a couple of stage shots. But you know, during your reception or during your bridal preparations, during hair and makeup, for the girls, if they're laughing it up, having a good time, they're playing music on their phones, they're taking selfies, they're hanging out with the flower girl. I don't want to interrupt any of that. I want that to be all real and again, captured as natural as possible. So again, going back to that fly on the wall status, if I can be over here in the corner and everything's going on over there and they're having the time of their lives and I just snipe in with a 7200 lens, get that moment, boom, they don't know I've got it until they see the final product. I know I got an amazing real laughter shot. I can't be like, you know, hey, uh, you know, Christine, can you laugh again? Uh, action. OK, good. You're all set. Like, you laugh, but I've seen it done before. So for me, it's like, hmm, again, I kind of bring this up again, but being one or two steps ahead of the game. If I see you know, the maid of honor rushing out with her girls and the bride's left inside, maybe they're up to something. Let me kind of slowly tag along and see what's going on. Oh, hey, you know what? They're taking a huge selfie by themselves in their robes. Great, let me go grab that shot real quick. And I don't have to necessarily tell them, girls, line up and do your thing. It's just get a wide lens, shoot the shot. They're smiling. Great, we move on. And that's kind of those, again, real moments on film. Um, best thing I can give an example for, I had a wedding a couple years ago. One of the girls in the bridal party was very, very shy. Not necessarily to me as a guy, a male figure being in the room with all girls and the camera, but she was more just the quiet type, didn't like to be center of attention, things like that. She kind of did her own thing in the corner of the room when her hair and makeup was done. Meanwhile, all the other girls are kind of hanging out, doing their thing. And I, I noticed that she was having a really funny time on her phone. And I don't know if it was her phone or the, bride and groom's, uh, the bride's phone, but she was basically taking selfies of herself, just making funny faces. And I realized when I was walking around the corner, I was like, 
okay, I gotta get that. But how do I get that without her knowing? Because as soon as she sees me filming her, she's gonna stop instantly. It's like, hmm, how do I do this? So I kind of walked back and forth a little bit, keeping an eye on her. And this sounds creepy, but <laughs> it was all for good intent. You know, I'm kind of watching her and I see her and I finally found out later on that it was the bride's phone. She was taking funny self selfies of herself with Snapchat filters and things like that. I said, all right, how do I get this? So I raced over, got a 7200 lens and kind of just started filming this way when I knew she was over there and all of a sudden just kind of went, and it hit roll. I hit the button. I started rolling for maybe 10 seconds. You just see her doing these funny faces. And I stopped maybe after eight seconds, turned the camera back around. She had no idea I did that, right? Fast forward three, four weeks later, I give the, uh, the film to the bride and groom. She told me that she had a bridal party viewing of her full film at like a Friday night. They had pizza, drinks. They all sat around the TV, watched the film. And the girl that I got the shot was there. And I remember that bride groom telling me that the one of the best moments she saw was seeing that girl have a really funny time with that phone because that was a real moment. You know, it wasn't like I said to her, whatever her name was, Katie, you know, again, go, action. And she's taking plenty. Is that good? No? Let me do it again. Like, no, this is this is truly what happened. And I remember the bride and groom telling me like that one moment for eight seconds was like one of the funniest things. They all laughed about it, they had a good time with it, and I was like, did my job. That's exactly what I'm here to do, besides other things capturing the story. Um, so again, you know, just those real moments are what it's going to take, in my opinion, in the cinematic artistic world, uh, your film from 100% to maybe that 110%, 120%, OK? Um, and I said, only stage if you feel it's necessary. And a couple of those films, are shots you saw, I'm going to show another film in a little bit coming up. There are some shots that are staged. Clearly, you will be able to tell they're staged because they are moving shots. You know, a couple doesn't just casually walk like this normally. But in the film, it looks natural. So. That's what that portraying it is. Um, OK, being able to think outside of the box. Creativity is huge. Guys, we all know this. We've got to be creative in our films. Otherwise, they just become really boring to watch. And I don't know about you guys, but if they're not, if any film, any video, anything that people record, if it's not interesting to watch in the first 25, 30 seconds, I tune out. I don't know about you guys, but I tune out. So how do I start off the film with that? Amazing hardcore shot. You know, in that second film, you saw the drone shot over the venue. You know, my, my second shooter, Max, he grabbed his drone, he grabbed that shot. It was awesome. I was like, well, that'll be a great way to reel people in and say, ooh, there's a drone shot, there's water in the background, this building is gorgeous. Maybe I'll watch this. And I'm talking about the people that aren't pertaining to the wedding. You know, these are people that are on Facebook that are just scrolling through and they see hashtags and they see my film. Great, that's how they watch it. Um, how do I start off with a, you know, do I, do I start off with a dress shot? Do I start off with a hair and makeup shot? What's my first shot going to be that's going to really make people want to watch this mini film? You know? um, so with that creative mind, it's, it's how do I think outside the box? How do I take the atmosphere that I'm in and really turn it into the films that we produce? You, know, you might have an awesome sunny day in the morning, and all of a sudden, during your creative session, seven hours later, it turns to complete rain. OK, well, what's my backup plan? Do we have a backup plan? Is it going to be indoors? OK, well, let's say we're going indoors. OK, so we have this awesome building where we have great lighting, great marble flooring, architecturally, um, you know, aesthetically looking building. That's great. Well, I wasn't planning on being here. So now i got to think outside the box to say, on the spot, where can we go? OK, we can go over there. I like this room. This has got some nice contrast here. The colors are really good on that wall. Great, let's try this out. And when I say that, you also have to work with the photographer if the photographer isn't already conducting this type of thinking. All right, so team playing is huge. Obviously, being a team player is one of the things that I strive to do, obviously. So if you're a photographer, I want to make sure that you and me are on in sync the whole day and that we're communicating the whole day. And when we communicate with each other, we also then communicate with our bride and groom. Because if you and me are thinking, well, it turned to rain, it was sunny, I guess those sunset shots are out of the order. But we have this really cool corner wall, and I know it's not big enough for both of us, video and photo, to get the same shot. So we communicate, and we say, hey, you know what? Why don't you get your shot and photo, do your thing. As soon as you're done, I'm going to jump in and do the video shot. Great. Well, thinking outside the box is, OK, while he's doing the photo side of things, what else can I be setting up for video to say, let's get a shot of the bridal party walking right here. Let's get the bride and groom over here with her mom and dad or something like that. You know, you're kind of put into a situation where, no, we weren't planning on being inside. We were planning on being by the water on the docks or outside in the gardens. And now we have to be inside. And this is an example that I've run into tens of 20, or 20 times, at least, um, where I'm saying, OK, I am here. i got to think here. And then when I think out here, we'll bring it back to square one. Okay? So 
thinking outside of the box, I, I mean, you, anybody can put that in perspective in any job that they do. You, you don't have to be in the wedding industry. You, you could be corporate world. You could be in financial world. You could be whatever. You could be car making, for all I care. But you have to think creatively outside the box for us to make our work, again, go from here to here. Okay, so again, that's some, something I think is super important. And I think that a lot of guys in the the video world, uh, you know, I, I'm guilty of this too. I think we get tunnel vision once in a while. And I think that we start to think about the same shots that we do all the time. And it's like, you know what? I gotta stop doing that because you know I don't want this bride who also knows this bride to see the same exact style of their film. I like to bring the creativity and make every film customized, um, completely different from the next. Whether that's the soundtrack, whether that's the opening shot in the film, whether that is um, the way we capture the ceremony, whatever the case may be, I want to make sure that you know yours is different from yours. And with that being said, you know that outside the box thinking and that creativity is just something that I try to take it to the next level. And hopefully, this class today, for those that are watching online, you know they're kind of getting some ideas, maybe behind the scenes, or they're thinking, uh, you know, right now they're thinking outside the box, where oh, you know what, I should try that aspect of you know creating a timeline, or I should try that aspect of you know, hey, if we're presented with a hurricane storm, what's my backup plan going to be? It's things like that. So, um, adapt and overcome the situation. So, I think that uh, you, sir, right here in the front row, we were talking about that before we started. Um, adapting and overcoming a situation, um, obviously, a wedding, I said before, this is a live event. If things go wrong, being able to have a backup plan right away will only benefit you and the wedding itself. Okay, and again, it sounds pretty self explanatory, but Adapting and overcoming a situation, it kind of goes hand in hand with thinking outside the box. You know, for example, I had a wedding, 2012, the blizzards came through New England, and I was slated for February 12th to have a wedding in downtown Hartford, Connecticut, the capital of Connecticut. I'm going to be up there for the day, going to be an awesome, one of my favorite venues uh, in the city. And the night before, a couple days before, they were predicting this blizzard to come in. And this blizzard was going to dump numerous feet of snow. And I said, you know what? This is not going to work out too well for us if it actually arrives. And sure enough, the night before the storm rolled right in, and uh, the wedding actually, quote unquote, was canceled. But we made it happen, and I'll explain how that happened in a second. But part of the whole thinking one or two steps ahead, also bringing that perspective into this example, was that the wedding was on a Saturday, and I knew that Friday night was going to be pretty bad. So I said, you know what? I'm going to go out and get a hotel room, same hotel room that the bride and groom are doing hair and makeup in the next day. So that way, if the storm rolls in, at least I have an idea. I'll be in the same room, same building. I'll be able to get up to bridal preparations, not knowing how much snow is going to come in. All right. So, uh, Friday night happens. I go to rehearsal dinner. Snow starts pounding 2, 3 in the morning. It's full blizzard conditions. Wake up the next morning. It's still blizzarding out. And the bride and groom says the venue, the venue staff can't get to the venue where the ceremony is supposed to be because we can't get out of our house. There's like six feet of snow outside. And I said, well, what are we going to do? She goes, well, we're going to try to do hair and makeup here. All my guests are staying in hotels because a lot of them are from out of the state. And uh, we're going to just see how the day goes. I said, all right. So I started doing my thing, capturing hair and makeup just like I normally would do. And it got to the point where um, the DJ couldn't get to the venue, the photographer couldn't get to the venue, uh, the venue staff, kitchen staff, could not get there in time to start up the kitchen to start up the food prep. And basically, the wedding was going to have to be postponed and canceled. Well, what ended up happening was a blizzard all day, and they did a makeshift wedding ceremony slash reception in the hotel that they did hair and makeup, which was not the venue they planned on. Now, I was the only vendor besides hair and makeup that was actually there to capture that day. So they did a small ceremony, small reception with the people that were there, and we basically made it work with some basic decorations that the hotel had lying around. Uh, a couple of the guys in the bridal party trekked it out and walked almost six blocks to the venue in the snow to get some decorations and some signs and stuff to bring it back, try to make it as comfortable as possible. They ended up doing a ceremony that made it legal. They were married, and we had a small uh, reception in the, in the hotel. They provided the food and everything like that. The next morning we woke up, had breakfast with them, still couldn't go home. Had like six, seven feet of snow on the ground. Maybe not that much, but the point is that there was a lot of snow. I was there for a total of four and a half days in this hotel when I shouldn't have been there at all, okay? Uh, long story short, the wedding goes on. They ended up, the venues that they were supposed to get married at ended up actually providing a reception for them free of charge later on because they felt bad that they had to cancel. The reason I bring up this story is that because A, I was uh, proactive and thinking one or two steps ahead, I said, let me get a hotel room. B, the reason I bring this up also is that I adapted and I overcame. You know, I said that night the bride was strict, uh, completely stressed out. The groom was stressed, but not as much as the bride, obviously. And I know that that day, I said, you know what? We've had a crazy day. It's like 8.30 at night. The snow's starting to settle down. 
let's go outside. Grab your boots, let's go outside, let's have some fun in the streets of Hartford because Hartford is a big city, not as big as New York, but it's a big city, and there's always traffic going by, and there's always the hustle and bustle. It was vacant. So let's go outside and have some fun. Let's get some really cool shots going for video. We'll do some really cool slow motion shots through the snow, everything. And the bride and groom were like, let's go. We love it. So we went outside and we spent like an hour in the snow. She's throwing snow in the air, playing around. I know at one point Hartford PD rolled up and we thought we were in trouble. And the Hartford PD cop goes up and goes, no, continue doing your thing. I just want to take a picture with the bride. This is like history in the making. We're, you know, a, a wedding in a blizzard, you know. So the moral of the story is that I kind of had to sit there and think, well, what can I do to make the best of a situation that basically went from the happiest day of their lives to something that almost <laughs> made her cry. Actually, it did make her cry, unfortunately. So I did the best I could. I had to adapt and overcome the situation. Situation. And to this day, I still talk to them once I can. They called me Cousin Matt. <laughs> they, even though I'm not technically related to them, because I spent so much time with that family, they basically said I was family to them, which is awesome. And I will tell you that out of that wedding, I think I did six or seven more weddings from that family. So again, not to bring up a long story that you know people in the, the, the viewing world probably have no idea what I'm talking about. I adapted and I overcame the situation, okay? So again, if things go wrong, being able to have a backup plan right away, or at least one that will come sooner than later to be able to make the wedding the best it can be, all right? Um, another point I like to make up is that move with a purpose. So this is actually a fire service concept. I'm actually involved with the fire service myself back home in Connecticut. And moving with a purpose is something that we always talk about in training and one of the things that we always talk about in general, just you know, moving with that purpose. You know, Not running around at a church, not running around where guests are going to think something is wrong, but if you know that time is constrained or we're running late or things kind of just went wrong for a little bit part of the day and we're trying to get back on time to that timeline, you know, moving with that purpose is saying, okay, to my team, guys, we're, we're really behind schedule. We need to pick it up. So when we go to pack our gear, let's not just pack our gear slowly and talk about what happened. Let's, let's get in the car. Let's go. We'll talk about it later at the office or the next day. Um, Moving with a purpose also means that you know if, if you are focused on something and you have a task at hand, make sure that you are paying attention to that task at hand and you're not, again, getting tunnel visioned, but at the same time you're not getting distracted. Okay. Now, what does that mean when it comes to the wedding cinema industry? Is my view is that you know when you are shooting a wedding, you know you don't want to show that emotion of things being rushed. You don't want people to look like they're stressed on camera. You don't want them to look and feel and have their audio sound like they're upset or anything like that. But when we're moving with a purpose, I mean that when we move from one location to another, or if we need to go, the, the wedding film I just showed, the second one, they had a two-room venue become one. I think they had like 400 guests there. You know, and if I need to know my gear is on this side, and we are staged over on the opposite side of the venue, and I tell my assistant or my second shooter to go grab me a lens for my case that I forgot to grab, when I say, hey, go grab me that lens, I mean, go and grab me that lens. Don't just slowly take your time and walk over there, take out your phone and start looking at Instagram as you're going to grab that lens. It's, oh, Matt needs that lens, let me beeline it to the room, respectfully, not running, grab that lens, bring it right back to him. You know, and, and that's something that doesn't always happen in my world, but I do know that we have run into situations in the past where time has gotten away from us. We start off the morning, everything's great, boom. I'll make an example up, the bus is late. Well, we can't control the bus, but now we have to make up for it once the ceremony is ending. You know, how do we move time forward? So again, moving with a purpose, just basically the point I'm trying to make is that people in your team or, or if you're working with a photographer, if you're working with a wedding coordinator, just making sure that you guys get whatever it is you need to get done in a somewhat timely fashion, but not making it aware that something is wrong. You know, to guests, to the bride and groom, things like that. Okay. So again, in the fire service, we use uh, move with a purpose because they're always taught. You're always taught to at a, at a structure fire never to run on the fire ground because that is where you cause injury, you will cause uh, panic, commotion, a whole bunch of other things. But at the same time, if you have a task at hand and you're dealt with a task to go do something, you do it purposefully. Okay. So that's what that means. Um, working alongside other vendors. So as I said before, uh, I am a huge team player. I love to create a game plan with my vendors that I'm working with the day of. I love when there are wedding coordinators because the wedding coordinators will then take a little bit of that stress off of me to be able to delegate what's going on. But a lot of times I don't have wedding coordinators. You know, These smaller weddings, you don't have a wedding coordinator because the budget might be smaller. OK, no big deal. Well, I know from my point of view that I want to say, hey, if you're the photographer, you too are a photographer, or you're the DJ, I want to say, hey guys, my name is Matt. I'm the cinematographer. This is my guy, Nick. This is my guy, Max, whoever the case may be. Um, we're here. Can we get a quick game plan? What's going on? And I know this past weekend for that Greek wedding, 
the photographer I had never worked with once before. I had heard about his name and I'd seen his work, but we never worked once before. So I called him up mm, Thursday, the wedding was on Saturday. We chatted for maybe 15 minutes on the phone, got a little bit of a game plan of what he was looking to do, what I was looking to do. Great. Day of the wedding came around. Once the wedding ended, it felt like we had done like 10 weddings together. And that little phone call ahead of time was just enough to be able to say, okay, I know that you're saying you want to get a shot of the bride and groom doing this. Great, I'm going to track that shot in video. Awesome. Well, then I say, hey, Tim, I want to grab a shot of the bride and groom walking this way. And at one point, we're going to cut around and do a behind the scenes shot so it looks like a two camera angle. He goes, great, I'm just going to snap photos on the side. Boom, done. Simple as can be like that. So getting that game plan with your vendors, you know, when it comes to the entertainment portion of the night or the venue staff, and they're saying, hey, guys, we're going to be cutting the cake at 8.30, great. Knowing that, well, if it's 8.15, it probably shouldn't take off too far away because they're probably going to want to start the cake cutting sooner than later. Let's get that on film and make sure we don't miss those moments. Okay? So again, working alongside your vendors, creating that team, being a game player, sorry, being a team player um, and a game plan for the day of is, in my opinion, super, super important. And it will take some stress off of you. I really think as cinematographers, we do have a lot of stress because we do see that sometimes um, chaos can happen. Um, a DJ might not let us know as the cinema crew uh, what's going on, might let the photographer know. How many times do you guys get called the photographers? How many times do people say, oh, can you take my picture? And we're like, no, we're video. And they say, oh, OK, and they walk away. Well, if you're the photographer, or if the actual photographer is told that cake cutting is in 10 minutes, and we're not told, well, how does that make us look? We just missed the moment. Knock on wood, that's never happened to me. <laughs> but I'm sure it has for some people. And the point across what I'm trying to make here is that you know, if you say, hey, to the coordinator, to the DJ, to the photographer, I am so-and-so, and I am the filmmaker, and I have been hired to capture their day, hopefully in their mind, they're going to say, let the photographer know and let the filmmaker know of what's going on, OK? So just little tips and tricks for, uh, for the day of. Um, we're almost done with this part, guys. I know it's a long part, but I, I feel like these are very important uh, aspects to cover. Um, making the most of your time with the bride and groom and the bridal party during a creative session. Okay, um, This is more so for those weddings that people may encounter where they have a couple different locations to go to. They have a house or a hotel for both the girls and the guys. You have a church. You have a park or a city or somewhere downtown that you're going to go to in between the church ceremony and the reception. And then obviously you have the venue itself. Okay, So in that case, it's like, well, I have in between the ceremony and the reception, we have an hour and 15 minutes. OK, great. Hour and 15 minutes. Is that enough time? Is that not enough time for what I'm envisioning to capture for this film? OK, great. So we have an hour and 15 minutes. Where are we going? OK, well, the ceremony is in one town, and we're going to go to New Haven, New Haven, Connecticut. And that's 15 minutes away. But we know that, hey, it's a Friday wedding. Friday traffic gets out usually around 4, 3, 30, 4 o'clock on a Friday. Well, how long is that going to take, not necessarily for us to get there, but for the party bus to arrive too? Because obviously, if we get there before the bride and groom, we can't do anything until we have our bride and groom. So, you know, again, going back to it, thinking ahead, well, how much time does it take to travel? And then when you're pre planning your timeline, you can say, oh, you know what? Leave at least half hour, 45 minutes of travel time, just in case things go wrong, just in case you get a traffic jam, car accident happens, you can't get around it whatever the case may be. Hopefully these things do not happen, but making sure that they're aware that things can go wrong. And the reason I say that is because making the most of your time with your bride and groom, it's if everything goes smooth and goes to plan, which 95% of my weddings, everything does go to plan, and I mean that respectfully, um, you, set, you get on location, we're in downtown New Haven, we're at Yale University, the iconic Yale University where amazing architecture, um, amazing features and, and lay, um, grounds to cover, and we go, where do we want to go? Where do we want to shoot with our bride and groom? Where do we want to take the bridal party? You know, do we want to go to the Stirling Library and just do the bride and groom there? Or do we want to take the entire bridal party, which could be 10, 12, 15 members, and say, we're going to go to the open courtyard. And we're going to do a really wide shot with an awesome exposure in the courtyard. That's something that we, as the cinematographers, should be thinking about, again, when we're planning the day of beforehand. So that way, when you get there, the day of the wedding, you're not getting off the party bus, or you're not getting out of your cars with all your gear and saying, all right, where are we going? Um, I don't know what to do. And I've worked with some photographers, unfortunately, um, that have had that situation where they say, well, we've never been here, so we don't really know where to go. And I'm like, OK, well, I have ideas. Here we go, and let's go. You know, Most of the time, I've worked with, and I don't mean to keep bringing up photographers, but the reason, I, and this is all positive work, uh, attitude towards it, is because they're the ones that we are working with the most throughout the entire day. You know, Wedding coordinator, we're working with them from 
partial day, maybe half day. Hair and makeup, we're only working on in the morning. Um, the priest, you know, the DJ, that's at night. The priest is during the ceremony. But the photographer is the person that we're working with alongside all day long. So when I keep bringing up the photographer, it's not to, to make you know, anything negative about other vendors. It, this is not negative at all. But the photographer side of things, we want to make sure that we're on the same, plan, same game plan as what they're thinking. So with that being said, when I say make the most of your time with them, you know, the photographer might come in and say, I have a set mind and a set goal of shots I need to do. I have a list here for family, whatever. And that's great. By all means, that's your thing. You do it. Awesome. We, though, we might have the same idea. We might have a couple shots in mind that we want to capture. We might have some natural shots we need to capture them walking around. You know, visual, the reason we're in the video world is because we want to see motion. We want to see motion picture. We don't necessarily need 10, 15, 20 shots of everybody just posing there with their arm around each other. So how do we make the best of our time working with that bride and groom if we only have an hour, hour and a half, hour and 15? My thinking is you go into the day, you have that game plan with the bride and groom. You have that game plan with the photographer. You have the game plan with the bride party. I personally like to do, and this is when I work with photographers, I'm usually, um, uh, I work with them a lot. We come up with that game plan. We usually like to do where we work with the bridal party first. We get our bride and groom shots. I'm sorry, we get our, our, our guys and girls shots from the bridal party, whether we split up and two photographers and, and two cinematographers go one way. Um, we do uh, combined shots. We take the bride and groom with all the guys on one side, all the girls on our side. We take a mix. We put them all intertwined. We get those shots done. That way, our bridal party itself is done. They can head back to the party bus. If it's not a location where the ceremony and reception are in the same place, all right? They can head back on the bus, chill out, hang out. Then I can say, OK, well, me and the photographer are going to take the bride and groom. And this is where the heart and soul of my films come to life, where I get those shots of them walking hand in hand. Get those slow motion shots of them taking down the staircase, where you saw in downtown Philadelphia. You get the shots of. Um, uh, the bride and groom doing their own thing, and the photographer's posing them, and we're capturing a side angle. You know, this is this is where my creativity comes into play for the film. But I also have to keep in mind that hey, we only have an hour and fifteen, or we only have an hour because it takes a half hour to get to the venue. Then, so I have to start prioritizing in my head what shots do I want to do I want to start doing. Okay, well I need. And I don't like to do shot lists necessarily, but okay, I need a moving shot. I want a dip shot. I want a pose shot. I want a shot where she's doing this. I don't necessarily come in with a timeline and a piece of paper saying, okay, next, Courtney, you will do this and you will do this, Brian. We don't, we don't do that. But in my head, I'm thinking, okay, yes, I need a shot with the hands. I need a shot of the feet walking. I need a shot of him coming in the frame, camera stable. This is how my, my mind works. And, and you guys and, and everybody watching, their minds could be totally different. And I respect that. And I totally, uh, whatever you guys do in, in your creative mind, that's awesome. Because obviously your work is, is you know, why you're here. But for me, it's all about making sure that I have the shots I need and that I'm making the most of my time with that bride and groom. And that basically I'm not wasting time. And I'm not sitting there saying, well, has anyone ever had that feeling where they're just sitting there saying, I feel like I should be doing something right now, but there's nothing to do. There's always something to do, in my mind. You know, when you're filming a wedding, there's always something you could be capturing. Whether you use it in the feature film, or the highlight, or the trailer, or not, it's good to have. It's good to have a, a, a good archive of footage when you go to edit. Because now you're saying, well, I got 20 different shots I can choose from, versus, damn, I wish I grabbed that shot. I wish I grabbed that B-roll of the... Uh, of the sun coming down, or I wish I grabbed you know, that shot of the, uh, the tower with all the traffic going by to make it that city feel. You know, For me, that's like the worst feeling you could have in editing. You're like, I don't have enough. I don't have enough to cut to. And, and back when I started this, you know, 10, 12 years ago, I, I had those feelings. And now I'm like, oh, I have almost too much footage. What do I pick from? And that's good. That's a good feeling. And that means I'm making the most of my time with my bride and groom. So, you know, for those that are, you know, wondering, you know, what shot type of shots should I do? Should I be doing? Should I be doing a, a shot list? Should I be doing uh, a pre-planned checklist of shots? That's totally your call. In my opinion, I like to be creative on the fly, and I like to almost, for this aspect, fly by the seat of my pants. Just because I know when I'm thinking creatively, it's not with a shot list. It's where am I? How much time do I have, and what's my location look like? OK, great. I have awesome architecture. And you know what? I just realized there's an awesome staircase. I know we had said that shot, but let's go to this shot. And all of a sudden, they walk up the staircase, or they walk down the staircase. And I'm like, boom, there's my opening shot for the film. Biggest thing for me is how I think mentally the day of the wedding. So again, I know I'm kind of all over the place with this aspect of this topic. But you know, the worst thing you could do is go to a creative session for an hour and say, I have like three shots of the bride and groom by themselves. I have like 20 of the bride and bridal party. How do I make my film? You don't want to get into that aspect. Because if you do, 
you're going to be hurting when it comes to editing, in my opinion. All right. Um, one last thing, the the dues, um, and there's there's obviously a ton more dues that I, I could come up obviously in the in the in the in the future, but these are just things that I've noticed over recent years and recent months of shooting weddings. Um, saying goodbye to the bride and groom, at least you know say goodbye to them. Say goodbye to the maid of honor, best man, parents, vendors, if you can. You know this is just my tip, but I personally think it's really 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 unprofessional if any vendor does not at least say goodbye to the bride and groom after the reception's over. Whether that means you stay to the end of the night and the lights come on and everybody starts filtering out, or you're at a set time frame of a certain amount of hours and reception goes to 12 and you're done by 10, you know, at least make a point to find that bride and groom, stay those extra 10 minutes, search the room, find where the bride and groom are, don't interrupt them, but when they get a free moment, say, excuse me, you know, we're all set, check in with them, see what's going on, and, and say goodbye to them. You know, for me, and my team knows this if they're watching, I always say goodbye to them, to the, to the bride and groom at least. I try to find mom of the, of the bride, mom of the uh, groom side, if not both parents. I try to find the best man, maid of honor, because it's not necessarily a tactical thing, but it's just, it's just kind, it's polite. You know, you make that connection, you say hi to them in the morning, and you bring it full circle, and you say goodbye to them at the end of the night. Um, I know in the past, I've made impressions from people by just saying goodbye, because you never know, that sister who is the maid of honor could also be getting married. And if you say, hey, Sarah, it's nice to meet you. Thank you so much for helping me today with your sister's wedding. I appreciate you helping me with the dress and all the shots we did today. I know I put a lot on you, but you were a big help to us. She might be like, oh my god, I'm getting married. And my sister, you know, Colleen, who, who was that guy, Matt? Like, can I have his information because I'm getting married? Boom, bring it all in. You know, it's not necessarily a business tactic. I mean, it does end up in the long run working out that way most of the time. Um, but for me, it's just like I feel better when I leave a wedding and I say, you know what? I say goodbye to the bride and groom. I've had times where I left, I've left weddings, I couldn't find the bride and groom because she was in the bridal suite getting something done to her hair that a pin fell out. Or I couldn't find you know, the groom because he was outside having a cigar with the guys and for whatever reason I couldn't find him. And I left and I'm like, I really feel bad. Like, I never say goodbye to him. So first thing next morning, send him a quick text, phone call, email. Hey guys, I'm so sorry I missed you last night. I know we talked, we're all set. I'll follow up with you guys when you get back from your honeymoon. At least that's going the extra mile if you can't physically say goodbye to them in person. But for me and my company, I always try to say goodbye to them. I always try to tell them what's going on in the future, and that will wrap up when they get back from the honeymoon or their trip or whatever. And it's not just, all right, bye, you paid me, I'm out the door, see ya. I'll mail you your video. And there are guys that do that. And hey, if you do that to each your own, that's great. But for me, at least say goodbye to the bride and groom. Vendors, that's a huge important one for me though too. If I've worked with a photographer and I feel that that photographer and me are, are getting along really well and we can definitely work together in the future, I definitely want to make sure I give him my card at least. Definitely want to say goodbye to him. Even his second photographer or second shooter. You know, this past weekend, as I bring up before, you know, for that Greek wedding, I never met him before in my life. We never worked together. By the end of the night, I gave him a, a handshake. We kind of hugged it out a little bit. Um, I, I said goodbye to his second photographer, and we are now friends on Facebook. We follow each other's pages. I tagged them in their in the trailer that I posted. I made sure they got credit with you know his photography business and his personal name her photography business and her personal name just kind of brings it full circle and you never know it could get exposure for them it could be exposure for me not necessarily looking for that but you know it's just kind of a nice thing to do especially when you know again we are all here for one purpose that's the bride and groom so we are here to make sure that we are working for them so why not want to work with them as a photography group if we really click you know there's been photographers I've worked with where I'm like all right, take care. That's it. Just because the way they acted, the way they conducted themselves, the way they did things, I didn't necessarily agree with. I want to make sure I'm not associated with that. I find, though, I, I don't work with too many of those photographers, and that's a good thing. Um, and for me, I'm working with the positive end. You know, there's a lot of people that I do work with. You know, Aaron Miller. You'll see some photos coming up. He's one of my uh, my favorites that I work with. And for those watching, I, I do work with a ton of photographers, as I'm sure everybody else does. Um, actually, I don't really know too many weddings that only have video, if not, you know video and photo. Um, <clears throat> but we have a great partnership together. You know, he always tries to get some behind the scenes photographs of me working. You know, I try to shoot some video of him posing a bride, you know, or, or doing whatever. So that way we can kind of market the stuff as well. So creating that friendship within vendors, you know, that will again bring your business from here to here. I know a lot of my work is networking and word of mouth, as I mentioned in the, in the beginning of this class. So a lot of my bride, I had a bride call me this morning or yesterday and followed up with me this morning on the train ride here. So uh, she had uh, interested in video and she would heard of me from the photographer and I always ask I was like oh, hey Gina how did you hear of me she goes um uh, the photographer I'm looking with Aaron Miller um, he recommended me as your number one video guy I was like awesome 
just brought that home. You know, that's that's awesome. And I always try to call them up and say, hey, bro, thank you very much for giving me that recommendation. Uh, I just booked with Gina, and we're going to be working together in 2020. And that's that's an awesome vibe. Um, for those that are preferred with venues, um, you know, the, that's an awesome relationship to have. The, the venue that I was actually just at before in the second film, it's called the Waterview in Monroe, Connecticut. Lake Zora's right in the back. We're preferred. We're one of three video guys on that, on that list. So we get a lot of business our way from bridal shows, from the, the uh, coordinators and the um, um, people that run the venue saying to the bride and groom, hey, so you're getting married, um, and we're great that you're going with us, and you're looking at you know, HK photography. Great. Um, you looked at video. And they say, no. And we say, here's Matt Van Ness's information. Check him out. And then I get a bride that emails me a couple weeks later. So our venue, the Waterview, recommended us for your services. Awesome. Home run right out of the park in my book. And that's, again, going to bring in more business. Um, again, to tie it all in, just saying goodbye. That's a huge thing. Say goodbye to the staff at the venue if you know them, especially if you're preferred there. You know, hey, Aubrey, you know, hey, I'll see you in two weeks at the, the next wedding. That's awesome. Great. Got that connection. You never know where that's going to go and where that can lead you in your business um, further down the road. All right. So I know there's a lot of the do's. There's a few don'ts coming up and a couple other things I want to I want to show you guys. But right now, is there any questions? Does anyone have anything about you know the do's and everything like that? Hopefully it's self-explanatory. But you know, you never know what somebody might not be thinking about. You know, moving with a purpose, in my opinion, is something that you know I, I don't see many guys talking about. And for me, that's a huge aspect of what I do. So yeah, yeah, oh, no, no. oh, good. Um, you, you, you mentioned a lot about using that 70 to 200. Yeah. Um, the 7200 is not my go-to lens in terms of like the entire day, but it is definitely a lens that I use in my business um, multiple times throughout the day. Um, 7200 is obviously great for those ceremonies because again, I personally in my business like to be behind the scenes. So if I can be in the back or on the sides, but I still want to get that close, intimate shot. 7200 is my go-to lens for that. Um, you know, during the reception, you know, if people are partying in the dance floor, I try not to be on the dance floor too much. We have a, a three-axis gimbal rig that allows us to kind of glide around the dance floor a little bit. But when it comes time for partying, I don't want to be this close to our guests, you know, filming them, laughing it up. So those shots where you saw in the second film where those guys were all having a fun time, that was actually a 24 to 105, but I was actually farther off the dance floor. But I had it zoomed in almost 105 millimeters to be able to get that tighter shot. But the guest was like, oh, he's way over there. He's not right here. You know, so again, that emotion wants to come out. I want to show that emotion in my films uh, full force right on screen, you know, right there. So you can almost see you know, the makeup that was applied, but not have to be like, oh, I'm breathing down Rhoda's neck and be like, OK, don't move. I'm filming you getting your eyelashes put on. <laughs> I want to kind of back it up and say, all right, well, there it is. Let me put a 7200 on here, and you can be over there, and I can still zoom in to 80 millimeters and get that great shot. But she doesn't know, oh, oh, you're way over there. She doesn't know where I am. So it is a go-to lens, but it's not a go-to lens for the entire day. It's definitely a work tool, a workhorse in my arsenal of lenses, though, for sure. For sure. So yeah. Yes. On the main camera? Yeah. Yeah, so throughout the day, so, and we'll talk about the gear that I use in a little bit coming up in part one of the slides I have. But uh, the cameras that we use are the Canon C100s. We have the, the Mark IIs, the Mark Ones, And we do change our lenses quite often throughout the day. Um, I don't have a specific camera body that is designated to just one lens. And I, I, we have multiple bodies. And, and my team, we all have the same cameras. So what the nice thing about it is I can say, if you're on my team, here's a 24 to 105, and you take the 7200, and I take the 100. We do do that. But there are times where, again, in a stressful situation where time may have gotten away from us, I might say to my second shooter, hey, man, I know you were going to be with me for this creative session, but right now we're running behind. I need you to go inside and start doing detailed shots at the tables. I will take care of the creative session outside. So when I'm outside, now I'm by myself. I may have two camera buys with me. I may not, because maybe I left one inside for pre-staging purposes. But I might say, well, I have one body. It's the Mark II. You know what? I need a really wide 24 lens on there. Great. OK, next shot, I really need that macro put on. So I do find myself popping lenses on and off um, more than not, to be honest with you. Yes. Since you change different lenses, you have to, you have to balance your gimbal again. Yes. So with the gimbal, we are not changing lenses. 
So I have a, a third body that is specifically designated for just the gimbal. Okay. So that body has a specific lens on it. It's actually a 14, but with our cameras, it's a crop sensor, so it becomes a 24 millimeter lens. That body and that lens stays as that rig. And then the other cameras that we have are the ones that we're changing out here and there. When it's the reception, not so much changing too, too much because the reception, you know, it's just straightforward. We're capturing the reception and capturing the moments that are going on. Yeah. But like during the creative session, I might want that really wide shot of the bridal party at a 24 millimeter lens. Okay, great. And then I want a uh, zoomed in shot with a, a 70 to 200 or something like that. Okay, then I'll switch that off, put the 70 to 200 on, grab that shot, then maybe switch back out. It all depends on the situation that you're in, the atmosphere you're in, the location you're in, the lighting. I mean, these are these are like camera ops 101 for the you know those are watching. You know, knowing where you are and what you're going to have presented in front of you. Saying, okay, well, if we're going to go to Yale University, and I know that they have the Stirling Library. I'm using this as an example. And it's really high, really cool architecture, and I really know one of my shots I want to put is the bride and groom, where it's going to make them look tiny, and the whole building as my main focus. Well, what lens do I want to do? I could put a 7200 on there, but then I have to stand almost you know, 500 yards away to capture that shot. Who knows who's going to walk in front of me and be in my way? So I could say, well, you know what? Let me put a 24 on, put it on a tripod, get a little bit closer to the action, still get that ceiling to floor ratio, and be able to capture the shot that I want and not have to you know, move around too, too much. So again, the lens changing aspect of what I do, it is common. But it's also something that I'm not doing like literally every other shot, I'm not changing my lenses. You know, if I'm putting a 7200 on, I know that that 7200 on is probably going to be on there for a good portion of the day. And it's not like throw the 7200 on. Two seconds later, take it right off. Throw the macro on. Two seconds later, take no, 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 no. I mean, for those that are working with one camera, you know, they might be single or solo videographers that are in the wedding industry. They might have to change their lenses a little bit more often, and that's totally cool. I personally recommend at least having a second body, if not a backup. <laughs> um, but you know, if you're on a budget or you're starting out and you only have the ability to have one camera and maybe a couple of lenses, yeah, you will have to change out if you want to have different size shots and different ratios, but. That all comes in time, obviously, and the way you're picturing your film to be, too. Um, I think a big part of it is also knowing how do I want to film this wedding and saying, does the first shot that I want it to be, does it, do I want it to be wide? So then when, when you're home, before you get to the church or before you get the bridal prep, stage the camera and have that wide lens on. So as soon as you get out of the car, check your exposure, check your white balance, check your framing, start rolling. You know, so it all depends on, you know, not necessarily going to gear too much, but it all depends on what you may have for equipment and what your vision is saying, what's my opening shot going to be? Or this shot right here, again, with the macro, do I really want a macro shot if I'm doing rings on the table? Or do I really want a 7200 where I need to be back by the door? Or, or whatever. You know, if you have an 85, you can be a little bit closer. Or if you have a, um, trying to think, um, another lens, just, you know, a simple 24, uh, 24, 35, you know, 50, or anything like that. So does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. All right, cool. So let me move on here, guys. Um, the don'ts. It's not a lot, but just goes through some basic things here. Check the time. Okay, cool. Um, the don'ts. Obviously, obnoxious, obtrusive. You don't want to be that. All right. Just we kind of covered that before in the beginning, but I find it is something that uh, I have run into other vendors. I've run into DJs who are just really obtrusive. They're running around the whole reception room and they're not paying attention to what's going on. They're getting in our shots. You know, don't be like that guy. You always hear, don't be that guy. <laughs> we don't want to be those guy, that guy at a wedding doing these type of things. All right, being rude or inconsiderate. Obviously, we talked about that before, but again, you don't want to be rude. You don't want to be inconsiderate because again, a, it's not right to the bride and groom. B, you never know who knows who and who could be referring you. You know, you might get the simple aunt and uncle that's in the wedding party and you don't know that they're the aunt and uncle and their daughter may be getting married and you say, oh, screw you, get out of my way. How's that gonna look for you when you could be getting work? So, you know, you just wanna make sure you, you're, you're watching yourself and not that I would think anybody's rude or inconsiderate in the wedding video world, hopefully not. I know we're not, but. You just want to make sure you're keeping that in the back of your head because nowadays anybody can record anything with their phones and you just don't want something to bite you in the butt later on. Um, don't bring up personal issues, all right? I've seen this numerous times with people that are stressing out at a wedding and I've seen it with the vendors. I've seen photographers show up late and they're running late because they had a personal issue and I respect that. They had a personal issue. Things happen, but don't go on and on and on and on and on all day long about it to the bride and groom. Chances are the bride and groom aren't going to want to hear that. <laughs> it's not their problem to deal with. So don't bring up those personal issues. Really just try to put it in the back of your head. Try to move on. Try to still be what, you know, as best you can do if something really is going wrong. But 
My goal is when I'm filming a wedding, that day I go into it, I wake up, I always say if you're nervous, that means you're passionate still about it. If you go into a wedding and you're not nervous, I personally think you've lost passion and you're not on top of your toes, you're not on your A game, and something's not going to go right for you that day. So being a little nervous is great, but make sure that you know, you're not bringing up too many personal issues where it could affect the uh, overall atmosphere of the wedding. Don't bring down the excitement if you're coming in saying, oh, you know, I'm just so stressed, my dog died yesterday. Well, how does that make the bride and groom feel on her wedding day? You know, I'm using that as an example. Um, I've seen it with wedding planners, wedding planners who are just running around crazy and uh, you know, they're not paying attention to the little things. It's like, hey, slow down. Take a step back, think about it. Think about what we're doing. You know, for us, the reason I bring up the wedding coordinators is because they have a stressful job. We have a stressful job, they have a stressful job. So for us in the wedding world, take it back a step. If you find you're having stress, or you find you're having a problem, or something is not working out right, don't continue to stress about it. Take a breather, take a step back. It's always, in my opinion, worked for me. When I've run into high stressful situations in a wedding, if I stop for a second, think about where I am, think about what I'm doing and what needs to be done, and take that quick five second, it will come for you and help you to think a little bit more clearer than if you're just ah, running around like crazy. All right. Um, don't complain about past weddings, people. Again, you never know who knows who. All right. So again, I've seen this before. I've seen it where guests have complained about other weddings. They're like, oh yeah, I was at my cousin's wedding and the photographer and the videographer are just running around like idiots and I'm never getting a videographer. Well, we don't want to be the ones that are other stories to be told later on. Oh, Matt from MV Films was just an idiot. He's running around like crazy. No, don't, don't do that. So don't complain about other people's weddings yourself that you may have filmed to the bride and groom. Because again, that's unprofessional, it's unethical, and it's just not right, okay? Don't ignore your bridal party members, obviously. Don't ignore your guests, and don't uh, ignore other vendors um, and their requests, if anything. So if mom says, you know, hey, we have a request, you know, for example, I have this a lot of times, um, a parent may have passed away, and you know, they're gonna do a remembrance table or a chair or something in the front row for the ceremony, uh, candle lit or whatever, and maybe the bride and groom didn't mention that to you in your pre-production meetings, but the mom comes up to you and says, do you mind if you just get a quick shot? It my late husband, he passed away and he's not here today, but we're gonna have a table set for him or a chair set for him. D don't go up to the mom and say, no, it wasn't in my contract, I'm not filming that today. Again, you laugh, but I'm sure it's happened. You know, be considerate and say, yeah, absolutely, mom, we'll definitely get a shot for you at some point throughout the day, if not right now. And that'll just take their, their, their mindset from here, again, to up here, about you at least, okay? Um, don't tell or demand the bride and groom in doing something. You know, ask them professionally, ask them kindly, obviously. You know, the worst thing you can do is at a creative session with everything else going on to a bride and groom say, okay, Christine and Bill, definitely go over here and definitely do this and do this and, and on three, two, one, look here, don't do that, don't turn around, make sure you're paying attention to me. No, don't, don't be like that guy, okay? Make sure you're saying that, hey, you know, Brianna, Chris, if you don't mind, can I grab a shot with you guys walking to me? I'm gonna film it from here and then I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what to do. More than likely, they're going to be like, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Do whatever you got to do. That's fine. But you know, ask them. Don't just assume they're going to do it, or don't just demand it. Because if you do that, chances are they're not going to want to you know, work with you on that. They're going to say, well, no, you didn't ask me nicely. Why, why do we have to do that? You know? And again, we're there for them. So it should be all about their day. It should be all about what they want. And if you have a vision for a shot, explain it to them real quickly and ask them, do you mind if we do this? And chances are they're going to be like, sure, no problem. Um, don't get frustrated in front of the bride and groom. You know, again, as I mentioned before, a lot of things the don'ts are things we've talked about already. Don't, if you are stressed and things are going wrong, don't show that in front of the bride and groom. You know, I had that, I'm trying to think when it was. I had a card fail on me. Luckily, you know, <laughs> it, we recovered it and everything like that. But I had a card fail on me. I did not once go up to that bride and groom and show her the fear in my eyes that this car failed on me. You know, I, obviously we got it back and everything like that, and that's a whole different topic. But I'm not going to go up to the bride and groom and be like, "Oh my God, I lost everything," or "Oh my God, the camera broke," or "We didn't bring backup equipment." Obviously, these are things hopefully that people are doing to prepare for, as we were during that situation. But I'm not going to show that. And I remember one specific event. My editor Jessica, she was with me at a wedding, and. Um, she was shooting a little bit, she was seeing what's going on, and I had a stressful moment, and it happened. I calmed myself down, my team was calming me down, she was there observing it, and I remember later on in the studio she was like, I don't know how you did that, but that was such a stressful moment, and you did not show it one bit except to the three of us. And we got back, and she's like, how the hell did you do that? Because you did not look stressed at all while the day went on. Inside, she goes, I know you well enough to be like, you were hurting and you were stressed, but you didn't show it at all, and that's just 
mind over matter. You know, taking that quick, okay, here's the backup plan, something happened, okay, it's a live event. Again, you can't control everything that's going on. How do I adapt and overcome? And how do I say, this will be my game plan, I'll fix it later. What do I have to do to continue the day's events right now? I'm in the moment, can't pause the day, can't let anybody know something might have gone wrong, but how do I fix that? And that's where, you know, taking that step back and just, okay, here we go. All right, let's go back to the creative shot. Let's do this. All right, Max, go grab that shot and get back into the mode of it, and, and you'll figure it out as you go, okay? So hopefully that will, will help you guys in the future. But again, getting frustrated, swearing, you know, just, just throwing things around, that does not help. And I personally have never done that, and I've never seen a photographer do that, but I've seen other people in general in the wedding industry have almost quote-unquote meltdowns. And that's the worst thing you do in front of the bride and groom. You want to do that at your office or your studio or behind the scenes? Totally cool. Not in front of the front of the couple. Not for the people you're working for. All right. Same thing. Lashing out, overreacting to a situation. Definitely don't want to do that. So, hopefully, these whatever six to eight uh, concepts here for the don'ts are things that you know make sense. Things that uh, hopefully people are not doing. Um, but. How many guys you know have ever had the situation where you run to a bride and groom and they say, uh, "Yeah, I'd like to inquire about uh, possibly booking a cinematographer or a videographer for my wedding." And I always bring up the question, "Well, what's making you hesitant?" Oh, well, you know, I was at my cousin's wedding and they had a videographer and he was just clunky tripods all over the place and they were rude to us and they were demanding us to do this and they had big camera lights and this and that. Well, that doesn't give us a good name, you know. So you want to make sure you're not creating anything now in 2019 for 2020, 2021, where brides are going to be like. We don't want video. We're all set. I'll have my uncle record on my phone. Definitely don't want that to come into play. So do anything in your power to make sure that you look on stage present at all times. OK? Uh, let's see. OK, so I'm not gonna, there's, there's a lot of stuff here. Obviously, I'm not going to go into everything too much. Um, but a few tips and tricks. Uh, remember, you are capturing once in a lifetime moments. These are moments that cannot be you know, brought back in time. And these are moments that the bride and groom, this is why they're hiring you to, and they're paying you all this money to capture their day. Because they trust you, and they trust the work that you've shown them in the past, that you will be there for their day, and you will capture those moments. Okay? Uh, again, as I mentioned before, reviewing your cinema timeline the morning before leaving the wedding. You know, Things like knowing the bride and groom's name, that's pretty important. Maybe knowing the maid of honor, best man's name, mom and dad, just things. So you know, when you show up and you say, hey, Brianna, nice to meet you. You're the maid of honor. And she goes, how'd you know my name? Boom, brownie points right there. You know. Prep your gear the night before, knowing, uh, knowing you will not forget anything come the day of the wedding. So make sure your, your batteries are charged, your gear is prepped. Make sure you uh, know exactly what you need, where it is, and what case, things like that. Uh, for those who are starting out, it might be a good idea to create a gear, check, a gear prep checklist. And basically, um, you know, knowing that I need all my lenses, all my audio gear, all of my lights, all of my camera bodies. And as you start to go further in your profession, you will get this to become memorized. Okay. Um, Review before walking into bridal preparations. The maid of, oh, I mentioned that before. Parents' names, bridal party members' names. These are key people that are helping you throughout the day. Um, filming specific shots in order of appearance. So this is one thing I like to touch base on upon briefly. It's called editing in the camera. And some of you may not know what that is. Some of you may not know what that is. Editing in the camera is a concept that I swear by. And it's something that I do in any shoot that I go to, whether it's a wedding or whether it's corporate. Editing the camera, what I mean by that is when I'm filming a wedding and I'm filming a shot of the dress, and I am filming a shot where I'm sliding my camera from left to right, I know that, hey, maybe my next shot should not be a left to right shot. Maybe it should be a push in shot. Maybe it should be a tripod shot. Should I rack focus? Should I frame it with the rule of thirds? Should I slide from right to left this time? Because nothing, in my opinion, works, looks worse than showing a left to right shot, a left to right shot, a left to right shot. It just gets repetitive. And people start to start almost knowing what's coming next. You don't want that to happen. So make sure that you have an idea ahead of time. And when you're shooting, you're filming your weddings, you say, well, if this shot is going to go this way, I want an overhead shot on a tripod locked down. And maybe the next shot is a motion shot where I'm backing up or tracking in. Just food for thought. Don't, you don't have to necessarily do it that way. It's just something I do. And I found it very successful. Um, knowing your game plan before walking into the wedding. Again, the beginning, the middle, and the end. So your story. We're storytellers, guys. And the way I like to tell my stories is you have a beginning, you have a middle, and you have an ending. And your middle is kind of like your climax. So your ceremony, the kiss, the vows, the walk out of the church, or, or the celebration at the end. You know, For example, in the Greek wedding when they're throwing rice. Now that's an awesome shot right there. All right. This also saves in post-production work and workflow values. Okay. What I mean by that is when you have shots and you have a story flow, when you're editing, you can kind of say, oh yeah, well, these shots go here. 
These shots go for the ceremony, these shots go for my creative, and this shots are for my reception. Kind of have that all kind of filtered out when you go to edit. Now you're just taking your shots and putting them into the order you want to show in your film. You're not sitting there with a blank piece of paper going, uh, I don't know where to start. Because that's the worst thing. It's like, it's like a writer's block. Where do I go? Where do I start? How do I create this film? Again, if you're at the wedding and you're filming and you're saying, that silhouette shot I just captured with the sky in the background, that was sick. That's my opening shot. That's editing the camera, in my opinion. Bring it to the computer, opening shot, silhouette, done. All right, so a little tip and trick there. Um, let's see, for when you're starting out, camera gear, really knowing what you actually need and what is necessary to purchase at first, okay? Huge point. Guys, I've been doing this for 13 years, 14 years now in general. When I started off, it was not the digital world, it was tape. And what camera did I have to get and what type of tripod did I have to get? It almost, it's kind of funny. I, would never want to look back at that, that gear. It was just so bad back then compared to what it is now, obviously. And, and 30 years from now, I'm going to look back at the C100 and say, well, that was pretty good, but now look what we got. Okay. So when you start, if somebody that's watching online right now is starting out their, their company and saying, I want to shoot weddings, but I don't really know what to get, don't go out and say, I'm going to buy every piece of gear that B&H sells. I mean, B&H would love that, but for your budget, it's not going to work out. You need to have the proper gear to be able to build a portfolio of work, to be able to show your clients to say, hey, I like your style or I like the way you're going. Yeah, we'll hire you. I know you're starting out, but maybe it's a backyard wedding. Okay, great. Do I buy one camera? Do I buy two? Guys, buy a solid tripod at least, if anything. Buy a tripod that you know how to work. You don't need to go out and buy a gimbal your first wedding. You don't need to have a drone for your first wedding, in my opinion. But you do need to have a solid tripod. You do need to have a camera, maybe a backup, the proper SD cards, a computer at least, <laughs> to edit your footage. These are things that we obviously take for granted being in the cinema world. But some people sit there and go, well, what's more priority? Camera or a computer? Well, they're kind of both. So do I buy the highest end computer and the lowest end camera? Or do I kind of maximize and balance it out and say, I'll buy this camera and this computer. They're about the same. That works in my budget. And as I get more weddings, get more funds, maybe I'll start to increase that and jump up in a couple more lenses and maybe a desktop system versus a laptop. All right? So just things to think about. You, know, you don't need to go out and spend tens of thousands of dollars on one lens and only have one tripod. Mix it up a little bit. All right. Um, besides visuals, audio is a crucial part of the wedding story. It's obviously why we are creating a film, because first half is visuals, second half is audio, what you hear. So what you see is what you hear, what you hear is what you see. So talk about mics for a second. Obviously, wireless lapel mics like the one I'm wearing, that's crucial for a ceremony. I like to mic up my grooms. Groom being that he's wearing a jacket, can't really see the mic if he's in a dark suit or dark tux. Can't really mic up a bride because she's got a gown on, especially if it's strapless. Can't really put a mic in the... Uh, Leave it area. <laughs> doesn't work too well. She'll probably say no as well. Um, I got lucky at the Greek wedding where they had the two priests that said, I'll wear a mic. No problem. Great. Awesome. Um, but I'm not going to go into too much about audio because that's a whole other class in itself. But just knowing how you're going to capture your audio, what type of microphones you might need, whether it's a wireless system, a lab system, a, a, a recorder itself, a plug into the system at the DJ. Knowing that you're going to capture the audio is literally 50% of your film because I've seen some amazingly shot films. The shots are incredible, but the audio sounds like it's from an iPhone. And that to me just goes, no, I'm not watching this. And it's not anybody I know. It's like stuff I've seen online. Okay? So make sure you get the proper audio equipment. Make sure you know how to capture that audio. All right? Good camera gear, Pelican cases, cases in general, soft cases, bags. I personally am a Pelican fanatic. Ask any of my friends, they're going to go, you're crazy when it comes to Pelican cases. But make sure you store your gear, obviously, properly, safely, and you know, to the best ability that you know it's going to be protected. Those quick rides when you need to go from point A to point B and you're in a rush, not that you're speeding, but you're in a rush and you don't want your camera in the back of your car bouncing around and you get to the church and saying, oh, it's not turning on. Why? Because you didn't properly put it away in a proper case. Okay? These are things that are basic, but I just want to touch base a little bit on that. And the last thing I want to touch base on is that obviously in the cinema world, aerial shots are now coming to play. Drones are huge. Drones are, are something that takes your film, again, from 100% to 120%. We have a couple drones ourselves. I utilize them. You obviously saw in the, in the film in the second one that had the, the water in the background. That was a drone shot, obviously. But anybody can go out with a camera, mount it on a tripod, and look up at the church and say, great, we're at St. Anthony's. Or you can take the drone. Again, pre-production where you're planning out your timeline, say, I'm going to have 15 minutes. Let me get my second shooter to do an aerial shot 360 of the church. And again, you open that up as your church shot, and you bring the wow factor into your film. A lot of parents these days, quote unquote, still don't know really what a drone is. You know, bride and groom gets it. Bridal party may get it. But the mom and dad, the grandparents might 
well, what's a drone? What, what's that aspect? Why am I going to spend money on a drone when you can just get a shot from the ground? You bring in the drone, you do the shot, and they're like, oh my god, was he in a helicopter? And that's the reactions I always get. They're like, how did you get that shot? I'm like, we have a drone. Mom, mom, I, right here, I controlled it. And they go, ooh, ooh, OK, I'm recommending you. I'm definitely recommending you. So again, that's a whole other class in itself. I'm not going to go into too much about that. But if you are in the market for a drone or you are able to have it, A, make sure you use it safely. B, make sure you have your license for it. C, make sure you're doing it with a purpose. And there's a reason why you're bringing the drone in. Because everybody these days just wants drones for hobbies and fun, fun shots. Not going to lie. If I wasn't in this industry, I'd want a drone. But make sure there's a reason why you're using that drone. Is it establishing where we are? Are we showing the water? Are we showing the venue? Is it a castle? There's got to be a reason for that. Because otherwise, what's the point of flying a drone over a parking lot? Not really for a cinematic wedding film, in my opinion. Okay, So just make sure you take that food for thought. Um, some tactical techniques. Um, again, in-person pre-wedding production uh, meetings. Day of wedding film, cam filming camera ops. So you know, just using your camera, obviously, make sure you know what you're going to be conducting for the wedding itself. Um, editing post-production workflows. Music choices. Again, that's kind of a whole other class, but I just want to touch base real quick on it. Music is what's going to bring your film to life. Obviously, the style of music and how you use it in your films can add or take away from your film. So using the proper music that you feel as the creator and the content creator of that film is what's going to make the, the wedding that much better. Um, if you use, you know, if you have a really nice slow motion shot and you have a really elegant couple on the days in that city feel like my cousin's wedding in the beginning, and you add some rock and roll music to it, probably not going to line up too well. And hopefully you guys as the editors of your own business realize this and would say, nah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to use that type of music. I want to use maybe an ambient cinematic type of approach. Or I want to use a laid back piano vibe with a violin and orchestral, you know, orchestral set of music style. Um, there's obviously a lot of websites out there that you guys can, can download music from, you can buy licenses from. One thing I always suggest for those that are starting out, if they're watching, uh, make sure you license your music. Make sure you do not just take random songs from iTunes, throw it in. You never know where copyright infringement can come to play. And if you were to get caught, it will bite you in the butt. You will pay big fines. It's not worth it. Just spend the money, get the licenses that you need for the songs that you want, and your life will be that much better. Trust me on that, OK? Um, you know, end products. You know, how do you distribute your films? Do you do it on a website? Do you do it on a flash drive? Do you do it through a portal? Do you send them a, a YouTube link? Whatever the case may be. I know in my business, we do things with flash drives and online uh, viewing access from our website. But people are still doing DVDs. That's awesome. It depends on what your focus is and what your end result is for that couple. And that's something you guys only will uh, discuss with your bread and grooms. I can't tell you what to do. It's just food for thought for how the digital world is. You know, website distribution and flash drives are the way the world is going. Because you're getting full true HD quality, too, with that being said. Okay? Um, wrapping up with the bread and groom. And basically, how do we get, to, how do we get known? You know, again, as I mentioned before in the beginning of class, networking and word of mouth referrals are huge. 99% of my work is from people I've either shot weddings for um, in the past, or I am preferred vendors at, at certain uh, venues, or photographers. These images that you see are from my friend Aaron Miller. Again, as I shouted out to him, um, we work all the time together. He throws me business left and right, and I appreciate that wholeheartedly. And I try to throw him business back when I can. Um, you know, going back before wrapping up with that bride and groom, you know, when you wrap up with that bride and groom and you finally give them their final product and you say, okay, we are all set. You know, I hope you guys have everything, you know, great life and if we can be of service to you guys in the future, that's great. You never know. That bride and groom six months later might find a coworker at the office that you got to check out MV Films. He did our wedding. Fantastic. Here's his number. Boom. You get that call. Christine calls you and says, I work with uh, Kathy so and so and uh, you did her wedding and we're looking to get married. Boom. That's the best way you can get business, in my opinion. All right. Um, final product, how do we deliver? The digital media world obviously is here. It's been here with us for years. It's not going anywhere, in my opinion. HD resolution content in the 4K world. We personally do not shoot 4K. Uh, we do shoot some cameras that shoot in 4K. We dumb it down to 1920 by 1080. Um, we still have the big flat screens, in my opinion. 4K is here, but it's not all the way here. And I feel like you go to a random bride and groom, they're not always going to have a 4K TV. And if you shoot it all in 4K, they're not going to be able to view it. So you got to make sure that their, your audience is also going to have the same technology that you can produce for them. Okay? So most people have a flat screen TV. Most people are going to have a computer, laptop, iPad, iPhone, whatever. So if you shoot in full true 1920 by 1080 resolution, you know that you're going to hit your market and your clientele to be able to watch your film. Flash drives, 
you know, how flash drivers present it. You know, there's guys out there that are doing flash drives from Staples. You know, a little keychain flash drive, they give it out. That's cool, whatever. For me personally, I like to customize my flash drives. I like to take uh, flash drives that are the size of uh, credit cards, flat as a credit card, bamboo style wood, dialed up with a really nice graphic design on it, boom, that's how I'm presenting to them. Versus, oh, I'm going to go out and buy a SanDisk 20, uh, 8 gig flash drive that comes in a key ring. Eh, there you go. Where do you get those? So, uh, actually, those are something I work with a, a company that is in Connecticut that did, they design them. And we do all the customization design, like Photoshop designs and everything like that. We present them the graphics, they print them on, and they send us the flash drives back. Um, I definitely, after the class, give you some information on that if you'd like for sure. Um, but there are other uh, resources online. You know, they make flash drives that are like photographers will do for their photo albums and everything yeah. like that. They have flash drive books that you can get. Same thing for video if you want to do that. There's plenty of websites. I'll definitely give you that after the class for sure if you're interested. Um, and online website logins. You know, MediaZilla hosting. I don't know if anyone's heard of MediaZilla, but MediaZilla is, for me, the game changer. Um, they're based in California. They're an awesome company. And they basically allow you to host your films on your website with their uh, sign up that you basically go through with them. And you create an account and you pay a subscription fee. And you're basically able to add a password. And that password is protecting that film. So if you have a bunch of portals on your website, you give Christine and Brian their password. They can go in, check their film, put the password in, view it just like you gave them their flash drive. So in DVD production, you know, we have a scene selection button. And you do chapters. And you do first dance, parent dances, cake cutting, or whatever on a DVD. You get that on MediaZilla. You get that on the website. You get that on the flash drive. It's all one integrated program. And for me and my business, that's huge. That was a big game changer because before we did DVDs. Now, everything's flash drive and website-based uh, uh, pre presentation. So for me, that's huge. That's huge. So um, again, a lot of information that we can go into that at another time. But for today, I just wanted to give a brief overview of how we do our final products. And the last thing is just some gear that we do. Um, well, obviously, we're using Canon series, uh, the Cinema series. And actually, all of our gear, a little, little punch right here is uh, all this is bought from B&H. <laughs> That's why I love this store. I shop here all the time. Um, you know, we're using Cinema series Canon equipment, as well as the DSLRs. Um, we have uh, Canon, Sigma, Rokinon lenses, um, Manfrotto tripods, slides from Doozy, shape shoulder rigs, et cetera. Uh, we have uh, Sennheiser audio equipment, as well as Rode and Zoom. In my opinion, those are the top sellers. Those are the top name brands for, uh, for the wedding industry to use um, in terms of gear. Obviously, there's other companies out there that people are, are using that's completely fine. It's personal preference. For me, Sennheiser is the lead. Um, I think in terms of wireless systems, Rode and Zoom as well for shotgun mics, recorders, um, and, and other microphone audio equipment accessories. Uh, we do have a three-axis gimbal. It's a FreeFly system Movi uh, M5 that we are able to use with our C100s. And this is how we do capture our gliding shots, our moving shots, where everything is steady, and it's not that handheld, shaky feel. Uh, we do Westcott and generate LED lighting. A lot of stuff downstairs in the showroom floor is what we have. Um, we do have two drone, or a drone myself, Phantom 4 from DJI, and one of my other guys has a, a Mavic Pro, Pro drone. So we are using the drones. We are using them for specific shots throughout the day, as I mentioned before. And last but not least, we are using Pelican cases. All of my gear with the exception of my tripods, are in a Pelican case. Pelican case, I actually have a guy that retails it in Connecticut, and that's the only thing I don't buy beside, from B&H um, is my Pelican cases, because he's local. And he customizes all the foam for me, customizes everything to fit in there nice and neat. And the other day, I just happened to open my trunk door of my car, and the camera case fell right out. And boom, hit the ground. And I was like, oh my god, my camera equipment. I opened it up, nothing. Shockproof, water resistant. So they're solid, solid cases. I Plug Pelican cases for sure. I truly recommend them for at least the wedding industry because we are on the go. The weddings are run and gun situations. You could be outdoors, you could be indoors, it could be rain, it could be snow, it could be sleep, you could be in sun, and then all of a sudden go into cold. Pelican cases will definitely keep your gear 110% safe. All right. Uh, I'm going to show you one more film. And uh, we doing good on time? Wrapping up? Yeah, I got left five All right, cool. Show you guys one more film. Uh, let's see. You know, when they come together so perfectly like that, I, I guess, Haley, I am so immensely proud of you. Um, I, I am just so happy you found a man that, and, and it's been said, he's confident, he's got a, got a quiet, I think of him as the comfortable in his own skin persona, uh, with a heart just as big as yours. Uh, I know you've chosen the right man, your man, so, it just makes any father immensely proud to know that you have a daughter who has found a person who loves them completely 
um, and so truly that I can see. So I'm, so I'm first of all, just so happy that, that you two found each other and that Lucy was around to help make that happen. You know, I wanna, I'm gonna share a story. When Nate um, sent an email to my wife um, on a Tuesday saying, could, we get, could I get together with you guys? And her quick response was, how about Thursday? Um, and Nate came to see us, and of course he started with the story about um, the 2002 prom, but then he went on to say how he waited, and he inquired, and he hoped, and he persisted. And uh, Haley, he adores you. There's no question in my mind he adores you. He waited 16 years, for God's sake. True to each other, share everything. Share the joys, share the sorrows. Love much, laugh more. Be each other's best friend. Always speak well of each other, always. And when things don't go so well, forgive often. Married life is an adventure, and you will embark today on that adventure together. And even though you are individuals, the covenant you made today makes the couple more important than either of you separately. So today, think about who's here, all your friends, your family, those who really mean a great deal to you. You're beginning something new and marvelous. They are here. Remember your promises. Keep them with all your heart. And I'm sure you'll have that sense of joy and wonder that you're going to be having things happen that you've never lived before. So with all my heart, and on behalf of all those here tonight, I offer you my congratulations, my warmest wishes, my love forever as you begin this latest adventure. So one more toast, everyone. Raise a glass and join me in wishing Haley and Nate every happiness possible. Just so you guys can have, if you guys want to take a shot or two of it, um, let's see, this is uh, just some pictures real quick. Uh, just shows you know me and some couples and things like that. Um, but this is our studio real quick. It's newly renovated since January. It's our editing studio, our meeting studio, and then, uh, oops, that's our contact information. So if you guys have any questions or anyone that's viewing and wants to check out more of our work, you're more than welcome to. It's a screenshot from our homepage on our website. So. Um, I think we're wrapping up on time, but you know, guys that are here, thank you very much for coming out. Thank you for those that are watching, and uh, hopefully, like I said, this information I gave today, it's just an overview, you know, a little bit of my opinion of what I've seen in the weddings for almost 14 years, and hopefully some of it has uh, made sense to you, and uh, hopefully everybody's doing you know, what I said, if not, doing their own rendition of it. So, cool guys, thank you very much, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So.